Okay, we are now recording. Okay, great. Thanks, Stephanie. And uh, <clears throat> thanks, everybody. Welcome to the August 4th, 2023 uh, meeting of the Solar Bylaw Working Group in Amherst. Um, and um, thanks, everybody, for being here. An extended meeting today, starting an hour early to accommodate um, Jonathan Murray from KP Law to um, discuss some of the additional questions we put forward to him and his responses. Um, before we get started with that, um, let me review my notes with regard to a minute taker for today's meeting. Um, which um, was to be Laura, who's running late. And um, I'm wondering if we might be able to have somebody take minutes just for the duration until Laura gets here. Um, she's missed a few times. <laughs> um, okay. I I could do it if you want. Okay, appreciate that, Martha. So if you can start the minutes, and then when Laura gets here and gets settled, we can um, turn those turn that over to her, and then you can combine things, I guess. Okay. All right, thank you, Martha. Um, with that, looking at the agenda, um, we did have, uh, first up was to review the minutes from last meeting, 7-7. Um, that being said, uh, those meeting those minutes are not available yet, um, and so we will um, postpone that until uh, they become available. Hopefully, uh, for the next meeting. And furthermore, um, we were likely to postpone discussion on that anyhow until after we hear from uh, uh, and have a conversation with with uh, Jonathan Murray, uh, so as not to delay his time with us. Um, and, um, so, um, if okay with, with you, Stephanie and, and Chris, we can, uh, turn things over to, uh, to, to, to Jonathan and, and, and discussion of, um, our questions and his responses. That'd be great as far as I'm concerned. Okay. And welcome, Chris. Yeah. Thanks for being <laughs> here. Um, Okay, so great. Um, uh, welcome again, uh, Jonathan. You've been really helpful to us um, when we got early, uh, when we got this uh, uh, zoning bylaw working group um, formed and, and got going uh, with some tremendous insights and thoughts um, and counsel uh, for, for us in the town with regard to zoning in general. Uh, and as um, you've recognized, we've come a, a long way, um, and quite frankly, we still have a ways to go uh, uh, to uh, particularly address issues um, of, of particular importance and, and complexities maybe with regard to zoning, particularly on um, farmland, uh, 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 forest land, forested land, uh, and then some of our, the other questions we had around the nexus statement um, and um, and sort of how we, how it's proper to sort of map this out. Uh, and so really appreciate um, your your time with us today uh, and the time uh, to respond to our questions in writing. I presume everybody has those in front of us uh, from the packet. Um, and um, um, let me just ask uh, maybe first, uh, Stephanie or Chris, what you think and, and, and the committee, would it be best to sort of, um, Ask Jonathan to go over them, sort of um, question by question. Yeah. Um, or um, okay, I, I see general nodding, so that would be great. And maybe um, uh, is it would it be convenient for you, Stephanie, to bring his uh, Jonathan's responses up on the screen to share, and then we can um, start going through that. Um, I sure, do. just give me a minute. Yeah, great, absolutely, and and. Um, you know, I've, I've read through them, Jonathan, and just uh, again appreciate um, your your um, your insights and your your legal professional um, ability to help us uh, help us understand um, uh, these issues. So, oh, uh, thank you for having me, and uh, happy to answer them. You, you all had some good questions, and um, I took a brief look at the bylaw draft 
think Chris had sent me a, a few weeks ago. Um, so I'm happy. I, I, I didn't do a full review of that quite yet, but um, I'm happy to discuss that generally if there's questions. Um, but I can wait. I don't know, this, oh, there it is. Yeah, great. Um, so I, I'm happy to go through one by one if there's any questions. Uh, just yell at me, raise your hands, uh, interrupt me. I, I no problems whatsoever. So, so you all had split this up into kind of three main categories, farmlands, forests, uh, and then we had a mapping nexus section here, but I'll start with farmlands. And your first question is a very good question. Um, it had to do with prime agricultural soils uh, and, and concern about protecting those. Uh, as I said in my response, that is a, a, a very valid and common reason we see in purpose statements for these types of bylaws. It's certainly something the town um, can keep in mind when they're drafting and adopting it. Um, and so that I, I have zero concern with the group keeping that in mind and, and including provisions mm -hmm. for that. Um, and then maybe we take A and B together. On the flip side, the second question, uh, 1B, can we prohibit development on agricultural soils? This is one I, I'm not so comfortable with. Um, as we discussed months ago when I was here, and I won't say it as much as I did last time, because I know I said it probably too many times, but uh, the solar protection in 40A section three says no zoning bylaw shall prohibit or unreasonably regulate. Uh, so I have a concern that if we start adopting bylaws prohibiting solar in certain parts of town, uh, we might get pushback on that. That's not to say um, that the town is without any ability to regulate or, or prohibit in certain circumstances. Uh, please don't take my response uh, as saying we're without authority, but we should be cautious about adopting a bylaw that straight out bans solar um, um, on, on particular parcels. What I, what I would suggest maybe we look at, and um, this is for you all to decide and the, and the town to decide, is, is if these types of sensitive parcels, farmlands, and, and then there's the forests in the second section, um, are, are of particular concern, uh, especially as it relates to public health, safety, and welfare, uh, we might be able to impose additional requirements on those types of developments on these types of land, whether that be special permits or site plan review or particular screening or, um, a requirement that developers show that they've kind of exhausted all other abilities on this site, that they've looked at rooftops or non-productive uh, agricultural land, or, you know, I think there's a few different policy ways we could accomplish that. But a straight out band, I would just recommend we be cautious about that type of, um, that type of adoption. So maybe I take a pause here and if there's any questions. I guess I would have one question and, and then maybe Jack. Um, and my question is, um, as we've looked at the maps in Amherst, uh, of, of Amherst, of, of, of uh, what's defined and, and, and shown as prime agriculture, prime farmland and farmland of statewide importance, um, it covers <laughs> a remarkable amount of the town, much of which is not in farming. Um, in fact, I looked at my house and I'm, I'm on prime farmland uh, and there's nothing close to a farm <laughs> around my house. Uh, and there's a lot of forest land also that's in has prime far, prime soils or prime or farmland of statewide importance. Um, and so I just wanted to, in terms of of, uh, of um, sort of imposing um, restrictions or requirements for, for example, maintaining soil health um, with the idea that if a solar if a solar development is provided on 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 a parcel uh, that is in good soil but may not may not be a farm um, uh, and use used as a farm anywhere in the in the in the near past um, would it still be reasonable to require similar soil protection mechanisms 
or provisions for that land um, with the idea that after the solar array, the land's been cleared. There's a solar array after the solar array. It has good soil. We wanted to make, we would want to make sure that the soil, um, that it could be returned to, it could be then transferred over to farming if that's, if that's the landowner's um, intent. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that would be reasonable. And I think it might depend on the scope of what kind of regulations we're thinking about. But certainly, you know, say we had the these areas of town that are deemed, quote, prime agricultural land, and someone wanted to come build a solar array, you know, we'd have to figure out what mechanism we impose these requirements. But, but certainly things like, you know, um, you know, making sure that there's no if there's batteries on site, for example, that you know batteries are inspected so that there's no soil contamination, or that um, you know that uh, there's at, uh, there is frequent and active monitoring of these solar arrays, so that if there are broken ones and there's not broken glass in the soil, and you know, I think all of that sort of thing with with the stated purpose of preserving the health of the soil, should it you know be used in the future for agricultural purposes. I, I think that's reasonable. Um, it's going to depend on the specifics, but as a general matter, I, I think that's fine for the group to go into. All right. Thank you. Uh, Jack? Yeah. Um, Jonathan, you had some uh, some measures that you listed off. I just wanted to make sure that I made note of them, uh, starting with the site plan review, um, the, the various sort of levels of uh, a bucket so that we could steer, you know, certain uh, areas of town toward in terms of level of review versus something considered more benign. Mm -hmm. So what, what were those you just off of site plan review? Uh, and then you had, um, you know, Yeah, so, so I think site plan review, which uh, as you know, and if anyone doesn't know, is is more of an administrative function. It's not specifically laid out in the zoning act, but it's widely accepted, and, and most all towns use it. Um, the the catch with site plan review is that it, it can't truly be used to deny a project, uh, but it gives the town the ability to make sure that certain site features are are implemented when there's a use. So that might be helpful in this kind of circumstance where the the zoning act provides zoning exemptions for solar installations and we generally have to allow them but we want to make sure that they're done in a in a productive safe orderly manner um other requirements are uh you could impose perhaps a, a special permit requirement right uh, belcher town i believe has a special permit requirement in their zoning bylaw and uh, i know you had all asked for examples and Myself and someone else in our, our office are putting those together um, right now in an orderly fashion. So we're not just throwing paper at you. So I apologize, I don't have it prepared for today, but hopefully the end product is, is more helpful. Uh, so special permits could be used. Again, though, we wanna just be careful that they're not used as a pretext to deny solar projects, um, but special permits um, could be appropriate in cer certain circumstances. Um, I think those are the two main buckets, Jack, that you would okay. use for regulatory review. Um, but perhaps there's something else creative we could think of depending on the, a particular concern. Okay, thank you. Duane, excuse me, I just wanted to note that Laura Laura's joined us. Oh, good. Oh, good. Uh, welcome, Laura. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Uh, Laura, we were... Um, interested in, in uh, whether you'd be in a position to take minutes for today? Yes, hold on, I will. Okay, great. So Martha has been taking them up to this point, um, but um, uh, but it was sort of your turn. So we just got started basically. So it'd be great if you could take over the minutes um, and relieve Martha. Thank you. Okay, Chris. Yeah, I had a question about the uh, site plan review versus special permit. Right now, um, most of our solar installations are approved by special permit. 
there have been a couple that <clears throat> have been approved by site plan review, namely the one at Hampshire College, um, because it was considered to be accessory to the educational use. Um, but Amherst has a kind of history of putting the special permit requirement on a lot of different things, but then, you know, more than 95% of our special permit applications are granted. Mm -hmm. So there's not a sense that you know, if you if we require a special permit that it's going to be denied, it's more like it may receive more scrutiny than a site plan review because the use is not, you know, um, considered to be necessarily appropriate in the particular location. So the Zoning Board of Appeals looks at the use and whether it is appropriate in a particular location. But as I said, almost always comes up with the response that yes, it is, but we, here are a lot of conditions that we're going to put on it. So I just wanted to, you know, make that clear and kind of ask Jonathan, given that history, um, would it be appropriate for us to keep using special permit for most solar installations. But, um, you know, if there are some places in town that we really think, oh, this would be a great place to put solar, then have those by site plan review. Thanks for the question, Chris. And I certainly didn't mean to imply that, you, you know, we would, anyone is suggesting to adopt special permits as a pretext. They just offer that as a common a common criticism or a common reason for denial we are currently seeing from the AG's office in, in less artful bylaws that are adopted. Um, so just offer that up as context, but I certainly wasn't suggesting it. Um, if, if that is the common regula zoning regulatory permitting um, scheme that the town has adopted, keeping these uses by special permit, I think that's fine. We've seen examples of uh, solar zoning bylaws that um, were adopted earlier this year with special permit requirements that have been approved. So I, I don't have a, a huge problem with that. To your point about can we uh, designate different parts of towns um, that may have just site plan review, maybe just special permit, or maybe a combination of two. Yes, that's completely appropriate. Um, we, we should just be mindful. We'll get to this in the mapping section, mindful of how we map that but that's another tool that the group can use as well. Great. All right, Martha. Yes, I just wanted to um, sort of second uh, Chris's point and, and, and point out to Jonathan, there's been some concerns in the community recently because there have been quite a few examples of you know fires, both at battery sites and even in orange on the solar rays themselves and so on, so that by requiring special permits, it seems to me that we're simply asking for a higher level of scrutiny. Yep. We're not trying to prevent it. We're just trying to say, well, we really got to consider all the aspects very carefully. So it would seem that uh, given, you know, documented risks, particularly that we're seeing that, um, you know, it is appropriate to have the the special permit requirement, if, if you agree. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I think it's appropriate, um, especially when it's connected to safety issues. Certainly we wanna make sure that these are safe and there's a, a, a lowered risk of fire or explosion or you know whatever kind of problems they, they come, these installations come up with, especially as they age. Um, so yeah, I think that's, Martha, I think that's appropriate. All right, great. Uh, maybe we can go on to the next question or two. Yeah, so C yeah. and so C was, can we require uh, solar installations on farmland be allowed only if it's developed as a dual use project? I, I, I don't think uh, we want, we'd like to be careful with that. What I, what I would suggest is, you know, that section three limits is, is a limit on the municipality's power to regulate these. I think if a person were to come in and say, I'd like solar on this land, but I don't want to dual use, it would be hard pressed for the town um, to enforce that kind of requirement. But what I would suggest is 
whatever path this group of the town decides to take, whether that's site plan review, special permit or something, you, you might have some sort of provision. Uh, well, I'll just preface by saying I do include in my answer, you certainly can encourage it. You know, as a, as a general policy matter, you can encourage applicants uh, to investigate it, but maybe more as a regulatory matter, if, if you do identify these prime agricultural lands, you might have a requirement, whether it be through site plan or use special permit for an applicant to demonstrate, we've, in, we've investigated dual use and it's not appropriate for this site because of X, Y, Z, or I'm not set up, you know, I, I don't, I've never farmed, I don't farm, I don't intend to farm, but I'll keep the soil in healthy condition should, should someone else want to in the future. I think those are reasonable regulations. Um, and certainly you can craft a requirement that an application demonstrate that they've gone through their due diligence, dual use might not be appropriate for this site, um, and, they, and they've kind of checked all your boxes. But I wouldn't suggest that we can straight outright ban it if it's, if it's not a particular type of solar installation. Any questions on that one? I, th I think the next one probably ties into it as well. Can we require deed restrictions? I also would recommend caution with this type of requirement, just with any zoning bylaw in general. Uh, property owners are entitled to a significant degree to use the land how they see fit, and the municipality is allowed to regulate those uses so it's you know, in conformance with town plans and it's not causing a, a safety issue or, or whatnot. My concern with a deed restriction would be it might unnecessarily or unreasonably limit a person's ability to use their own property to you know, construct the solar use. Or it might be an additional expense, say the site is particularly small and they can't deed restrict it, they'd have to go out and buy another parcel. Um, I think we might be getting into territory here where a court uh, would see that as unreasonable. Um, I do talk about deed restrictions later on uh, in a different answer, but uh, just as a general matter, I, I would hesitate to recommend them just because we get into this reasonable unreasonable category and we might be imposing requirements on applicants that unnecessarily limit their ability to use the property. Um, that doesn't say though, you can't impose requirements that, you know, so pr preserving farming for deed restriction. I know Duane had asked a question earlier about maintaining soil health, and certainly we can we can require safety inspections and screenings and uh, you know perimeter controls and all that kind of stuff. So there might be ways to to get at that goal of preserving this land for future use or preserving this this resource without requiring this title restriction you know a deed restriction goes on that person's title it's not necessarily the easiest thing to remove um so we might have something a little more regulatory than title related to accomplish the same goal uh and, and then i suppose that the second part of that question is can we require uh through appropriate vegetative planting yes straight yes you can require that any, any questions on deed restrictions, dual use, vegetative planning? Yeah, can I just ask here, maybe um, elaborate a little bit on the on the dual use and, and your, your um, suggestion that we really wouldn't be in a position to require that um, on, on in certain conditions of, of yeah. so, uh, uh, prime soils and so forth that we would require dual use, but um, but to encourage it. And I'm, I'm just wondering, um, uh, like what if you know the idea would be I think then to to provide that the applicant um, has to first demonstrate in some way to the town or the PGA that dual use is not feasible uh, and then and, and if that if that is satisfactory to the PGA then a, the a more typical ground mounted array could be accommodated. Um, is that your sort of the way you would think about structuring it? And it, and if so, what would be that? What would be the the threshold of that demonstration <laughs> uh, that it's not technically or economically feasible? Yeah, that is a good question. So I think the first instance is 
the the mapping aspect or the category of land that the, the bylaw would quote unquote require this extra due diligence for dual use. You had mentioned that your your property is you know technically prime agricultural land. And so we don't want a, a circumstance where say you, not to single you out, Dwayne, but maybe you wanted to put up a panel or two in your backyard. Um, we, we don't want a circumstance where the bylaw says, well, you can't do that because you're required dual use. And you come back and say, well, I don't farm on this property or maybe you do, but you know, I don't farm on this property. I live here, it's residential. That's what I tend it to be. Um, so I think to your question about, you know, what's the level of scrutiny that might be involved, I think it's first going to depend on what areas or what types, what's your bucket of land that you'd like to impose this requirement on. You know, is it is it land that's undeveloped in, in this prime agricultural category? You know, maybe we 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 offer that as an extra level of scrutiny. Is it land actively used for agricultural purposes now? Um, that could be a requirement. You say, you know, for everything else, you can go ahead, but if you're actively using it for agricultural, we'd like you to demonstrate, you know, why why you intend on, you know, tearing down this this aspect of the farm and putting up solar. Why don't you do dual use? So so I think first decision need to be made about what are the eligible or what are the the targeted properties for this type of extra scrutiny, and then you can develop, you know, what's the rationale or what's the the minimum threshold they have to show. Um, in regards to their due diligence or their reasons why dual use isn't appropriate for the site. Um, it, to, to be completely fair, I am not an agricultural person, scholar, you know, I don't know how to farm and I'm sure that there's technical requirements or, 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 or practical requirements even for growing certain crops that might not conform to dual use solar. And so someone might come in and say, well, I grow corn and dual use isn't really work on this site because of the slopes and the height of the corn and all that kind of stuff, we should give some discretion or at least some leeway to those types of applicants to say, well, it seems like you've done your due diligence here and, and have taken into the particular aspects of the site. All right, thank you. Yeah, Jack. Yeah, uh, John, I was wondering if you, you go by John or Jonathan? Jonathan, but I'm not offended. Oh, Jonathan, sorry. All right. Uh, so Jonathan, I was wondering uh, with regard to other um, bylaws, solar bylaws that you are familiar with and if they speak to the agri voltaics at all. Uh, because for me, I, I feel like there's already on a state level incentives with the, uh, what is it, the, uh, the, a, the APR? Or the ASTGUs, yeah. yeah. So I mean, they're kind of hardwired. That Dwayne knows all about that, obviously. But um, so I, um, to me, it just seems like we would be kind of doubling efforts for no reason when there's a state program kind of already promoting it. If people want these credits, and for us to kind of like try to, uh, you know, improve upon what the state has done is is a is a big ask um and just i'm just saying you know it seems like it's adequately sort of supported from a state policy perspective and do we even need to really speak to you know aggravable day this is more amongst the working group not necessarily you john jonathan but uh anyway are you familiar with other agro uh voltaics being uh called out within the bylaws and uh, for other towns so off the top of my head, I'm not familiar familiar with other types of examples. I will say, and and that's why I, I uh, we're very fortunate right now. It's summertime. We have summer law clerks in our office, and so I have one of my summer law clerks kind of pouring over the latest version of solar bylaws from across the Commonwealth to see if we can find one to answer this question, Jack. Um, I'm not familiar with one off the top of my head. I can't promise you that there isn't one out there. Uh, but if we do find one, we're going to send it to you. Um, but to your point, uh, you're right, DOER does have this policy promoting dual use. Um, there's other state credits and grants and loans that these developers can get. Um, if you all determine as a policy matter that 
that's kind of sufficient for the town's purposes. I think that's reasonable. If you look at those requirements or those programs and you say, well, Amherst really, you know, wants to promote it even more, or, or we want to make sure that it's, you know, done in a, an appropriate way for local need in, in light of local needs, we can figure out a way to do that. Um, I think this gets into a, more of a policy decision um, rather than a legal one. But to your first question, Jack, we are searching. We I have a meeting today to see what we found, um, and we'll send you anything we can find. Super. All right, uh, Chris, and then Martha. So I have a question about um, what would be the level of proof that someone would need to present to show that they had done their due diligence with regard to figuring out whether their property was appropriate for agrivoltaics or not. I'm imagining that they would need to hire a consultant, but maybe not. Maybe they would just need to write a letter to the permit granting authority and say, I've considered this, you know, and for this, this, and this reasons, I don't feel that my property is suitable or my operation is suitable or whatever. So what is your sense of what kind of proof someone would need to show the permit granting authority that they've done the due diligence and it's not appropriate for agrivoltaics? Yeah, absolutely, Chris. I, so I think the first, so the first question is, it's gonna depend on the type of permitting scheme the bylaw adopts, whether it's site plan review or special permit, but as a general matter, I think, I think you could start at a letter um, simply from the landowner saying, this is the historic use of the site. This is what I intend to do. I've, I've considered dual use and it's, it's appropriate or it's not appropriate for these reasons. Certainly if, um, if this is accomplished via special permit, uh, the special permit granting authority, if they had either additional questions or, or they weren't quite convinced by that letter, they might say, well, we'd like to hire an expert here because we think the reasons you've proffered are, are not quite in line with what we know of the site or we've, we've looked at the site and we're not quite sure. So that could be the added level of scrutiny. But I, I think if a letter or, or maybe some sort of report or something from their attorney or from them, um, that, that's, a, that's a perfectly fine first level. Uh, we can add in some additional requirements or, or additional authority of, for the special per, permit granting authority if there's a question about um, the, the scrutiny or, or, or the sufficiency of the explanation. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Martha. Thanks. Yes, as I, as I listen to this discussion, uh, Jonathan, I think I'd be surprised if you find any other uh, bylaw that's really seriously addressed the agricultural uh, lands uh, for two reasons. One, it's this area in the Pioneer Valley that has the most productive agricultural land in Massachusetts. And then secondly, we're, I think we're at the forefront because we've got Duane and his uh, UMass research organization that are actively doing the research. We, we really are urgently in need of more data on what works with dual use. And I wonder if there's a way that, that we could sort of justify our requirements by saying that we really are, are wanting to take advantage of, of, of you know, some experimental work and uh, you know, help our community and help Massachusetts acquire better data on, on the dual use and what works and that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question and, and raises a few others. Um, to, to your point, Martha, you know, I'm, I, I haven't quite seen it. It could be, there could be other examples out there, but, but if the town, if this group or the town wants to be the, the, the lead town on this issue, we, we can figure out how to do that. Um, what I would suggest, though, is what the AG and what the courts and what the statute continue to say is, you know, the, the legislature adopted the zoning exemption for the purpose of promoting solar. Um, so certainly you could go the opposite direction. Instead of prohibiting prohibiting uses or whatever it might be, you might you might put in your bylaw incentives for dual use. Say, say, you know, we have standard setbacks or standard dimensional requirements for normal ground-mounted solar arrays. There's nothing to stop the bylaw from saying, but if you do dual use or you do you know, something of similar technology, 
you can have um, you know, either the special permit granting authority can waive certain dimensional requirements, or you might have less dimensional requirements, or we might give you some, some benefits not entitled to other solar uses. That's one policy way that you can uh, achieve that objective of promoting these dual, dual uses if that's something really important. Okay. Yes, I have more questions that my last question that's been submitted to you is sort of further along this, so I'll wait for, for that for more discussion. Great, thank you. Um, all right, this has been really helpful and, and relates very much to um, the agenda that we have uh, later in this meeting on, on uh, farm, farm, uh, uh, farmland particularly, so this has been really helpful. Um, all right, I think we're ready to move on to the second set of questions. Yeah, so forest, similar topic. Um, can we restrict the amount of tree clearing? Yes, you can. Um, uh, Belchertown did it and it was approved. Um, I think that's uh, what I would suggest though is we gotta be reasonable with the types of tree clearing requirements. If we say you can't move more than 10 trees, someone's gonna push back on that. Um, you know, you gotta, the bylaw has to allow for a certain amount of, of site disruption. But yeah, can we restrict the amount of tree clearing? Yep, uh, I think that's that's an appropriate one. Um, to that end, again, we talked about, this kind of ties into my last answer to Martha's question, but also the previous uh, of answer regarding deed restrictions. Again, I, I caution the use of deed restrictions. They're, they're more permanent than you might think. Um, uh, and I hesitate because they're a pretty serious requirement and it might be easy for someone to argue in court that it's unreasonable. But I could imagine some sort of incentive, say for example, you had a requirement that you couldn't cut down more than five acres and this person needed to cut down six, perhaps the special permit, uh, uh, special permit granting authority could allow that six acres if they you know, preserved one acre somewhere else. Um, so I think you could use the deed restriction as a tool and maybe your incentives or your lessening of other requirements, but a straight out deed restriction, um, it, I would suggest caution. It's just um, something that I don't know if a court would look on favorably, um, but could be used in other circumstances. So. Uh, the other one, which was fairly recent from the town of Douglas, is in that last paragraph there, just a straight limit on the clearing of natural vegetation to only what is necessary. Um, that seems to have been approved. I, I saw it in one other bylaw as well. Uh, so you could throw that in into your bylaw. Um, that's appropriate language, it seems. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the next one probably ties in as well. Can we discriminate these regulations and prohibitions based on the attributes of the forest? I don't wanna say blanket no, because I think that would be unreasonable of me to say blanket no, but I, it fills me with a little uh, worry because we're getting into this again, unreasonable and reasonable. And this, this might be my lack of knowledge in, in forest aspects of it, but we wanna make it there's a general pr principle you should know in, in any bylaw, whether it be zoning bylaw or general bylaw, and it's the vagueness doctrine. Uh, and the vagueness doctrine says an applicant should be able to look at the bylaw, generally look at the bylaw, and know what it takes to get their permit. It can't be so vague or so cumbersome or so overly technical um, that me as a homeowner or any of you as a homeowner couldn't look at your bylaw and generally say, well, I understand what the bylaw requires of me. I understand what I would need to prove and this is what I could get. So my concern when we, when we start discriminating based off of the type of trees, tree species, quality of the ecosystem, water filtering, a court might look at that and say, one, those, are, those might be onerous requirements. It would require me to go out and get multiple types of special um, experts and reports and two, you know, we might not know how the special permit granting authority is going to treat, you know, this type of species of trees versus the other type of species of trees. Um, I think the third point is, again, we got to go back to the general principle in section three, 
is shall not prohibit or unreasonably regulate, uh, we got to remember that you'd have to justify the reason for the discrimination. If there were a very special and rare breed of trees that only existed in the town of Amherst and we needed to protect those, I'd be more comfortable with that. But if it's just, well, we're going to treat oaks different than pines, than we are birches, than we are, you know, maples, we, we would have to really justify the reason. And I don't know if we're quite there yet. Um, so again, I, I think the general theme of these three questions are, you know, you have some authority to limit and protect forests, but those limits need to be, we need to justify them. And then the more particular we get in those requirements, the more justification we need. Um, so that's my just general comment on those three. But again, we can protect forests, there's ways to do it. We just got to be mindful of the method and means we, we choose to implement. Any questions on those? Let me just ask, uh, um, I think your, your main example is sort of like you can't discriminate by tree species. Um, uh, but let me ask, there's also this notion that not all forests are created equal with regard to uh, how much carbon they sequester, um, which is of importance to the Commonwealth, uh, or the eco service, ecosystem services they provide. Um, there is some, there is science around this though, um, as you say, it's, it's would probably take a expert for any given property owner uh, of a forest would take sort of an expert to sort of make that evaluation. Uh, but is there, or, or would you suggest that sort of the similar thing stands with regard to discriminating against, well, this, this type of forest ecosystem has uh, uh, demonstrates, you know, X tons of sequestration a year, uh, and, and hence it's above some threshold. So we want to pr preserve that versus this other forest area is scrubbier or whatever, um, doesn't sequester as much carbon. Uh, and so it would be more appropriate to have um, solar there. So without knowing, without knowing the technical uh, kind of, rationale behind it. I think what I would suggest is if there's an appetite for, say, uh, limiting the amount of acres on a site you could remove, perhaps there's a threshold, you know, if they, if you remove one, it's, you know, it's okay. If you remove more than one, but less than five, we require this extra level of scrutiny, like we talked about with the dual use, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and, and maybe there's, there's a way that folks can still use their land for solar, but appropriately protecting these forest resources and requiring additional levels of either application material, materials or scrutiny or showing that we've done as much as we can to protect this type of forest resource. Um, and, and, you know, we've balanced the equities of it all. Um, so I think there's a way we probably can can get those requirements in. I hesitate to say, you know, it's okay to cut scrub, but it's not okay to cut X something else. It, I think about it from an enforcement perspective, to be completely honest, uh, or from an appeals perspective. If someone were denied a permit and I go to the judge and the judge says, well, well what's the purpose of this requirement? Why is the town so interested? And, and the judge is gonna have to determine, well, is it reasonable or not? Um, we'd have to be able to defend it in court. And um, I'm not saying it's not possible. I, I just don't know. We'd have to connect the policy reason and the science behind it and then narrowly ta tailor it so that it's reasonable in the context of the Zoning Act. So it might take more <laughs> work, to be honest, but I, I think there might be some way we can, we can protect at it. I just recommend, again, caution. All right. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, yeah, Bob. Yeah, um, I do have a lot of experience in forestry, and I would really not want to try prioritize land based on the attributes of the forest. I think that would be an impossible task. And in fact, for your example, 
scrub on a landscape scale is more valuable ecologically than the mature forest. It provides unique habitats that we really don't find in New England. So I'd be really cautious to try to come up with this. There, there is no answer. The other thing I want to go back to is more specific. Um, we meant, you mentioned Belcher Town and 10 acres. Are there any more examples of a town uh, having lower limits? I think Belcher Town was actually five, if I remember their uh, latest decision. I thought it was five. I know the question says 10, but I think their latest spring amendment was five. Um, I'm not quite sure if I've seen less than five, but again, um, I can add that to the list of bylaws and what I'll do is I will uh, call them out, maybe give you a table of contents and say, you know, look at Belcher Towns for these reasons and look at, you know, uh, Lennox for this reason and, you know, who, whatever we can find that's relevant. Um, Bob, I'll, I'll give you a list of bylaws you can look at that are, say, less than 10 or less than five. Thank you. Yeah, great. Adding that to my list. All right. Any other questions on the four questions or any answers? <laughs> Great. Okay. Maybe we can then move on, Jonathan, to the mapping. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So mapping um, 3A. So this is the question of, of do we do a map as a preference or does it have you know the force of law uh base response to you all you can always express your preferences um i i really don't have any problem with any preferences so long as they're reasonable and they're consistent with the law um towns can make preference statements that this is the reason why we're adopting the bylaw this is our main objective these are the reasons behind it i i, I won't i almost rarely will ever cut a preference uh, if you'd like it to have the force of law, you absolutely can do it. I, I might defer to Chris on, on whether this is an underlying or an overlay, but you'd have to adopt some sort of zoning map in a zoning district um, that would be adopted through the normal zoning amendment process, which is 48.5. So um, if it's just a preference you all like, go for it. I, I generally don't ever have a problem with that. Um, if you'd like it to have the force of law, that's also fine. Um, we just have to be a little more uh, particular on how we adopt that. Um, and then we get into spot zoning, but I'd like to just, is there any questions about that one first? Well, maybe it does get into spot zoning, but I did have a question. When we were looking, we were looking at the maps and the different um, um, layers uh, of um, restricted land, conservation land, APR land, and so forth. There, there was this tendency, um, because we're talking about basically parcel level mapping, uh, and there can be, there's certainly areas of town we were looking at um, where uh, due to the fact that there was APR in this, on this parcel, but not this parcel, we were getting down to like individual property, you know, uh, property owners saying, oh, that'd be a good place for solar. Um, and, um, and I, I, I'm not, I just, it just didn't seem comfortable to me to on a, in a public forum to be um, expressing opinions or just even discussion about individual properties um, attributes. Um, can you give us some guidance and maybe Chris knows as well, but um, just in terms of when you're talking about um showing parts of town that could be preferences for solar i can see that sort of if you're uh drawing sort of general areas uh but if it gets down to like okay the, you know the, it's this parcel this parcel you know disparate parcels uh that happen to be available because they're not an apr but uh, but they're um you know uh, uh not 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 developed is, is that something that um one can do or well that the way you described it you know singling out parcels i will say just as a general matter chris probably knows this better than i do or can speak to it more than i i can we discourage patchwork zoning districts we we should not be i don't recommend we should not be you know having a patchwork of well parcel a is good parcel b is good or not good we're going to zone them differently now, that's not to say that you have to paint this with a broad brush. 
Um, you, you don't have to say, for example, everything south of Route 9 is solar and everything north isn't. Like, it doesn't have to be that broad either. You can, you can be mindful and, and particular about, well, you know, maybe, the, the, maybe North Amherst is good or bad for these particular reasons, and we're going to make our overlay here. We're going to have a second overlay down in South Amherst. Um, and, and you can draw your boundaries based off of maybe particular aspects of parcels. Um, when we get into spot zoning, and, and maybe just to answer that question, uh, there's two types of spot zoning. There's uh, spot zoning and reverse spot zoning. So uh, spot zoning is generally singling out a single parcel for that parcel's economic benefit. You generally see those, the cases are, you know, um, one parcel in a residential district wants to be a commercial parcel and they single it out and there's some sort of payment to the town and courts say, no, 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 you can't do that. There has to be some rationale, some consistency with your current zoning map and some policy reason why we're changing it. Uh, reverse spot zoning is the reverse of that. It's singling, out, singling it out um, to prohibit the use. So that's, we single out this parcel because, you know, the owner has indicated they're going to build a uh, you know, a dump on the property, and we don't want a private dump on the property, so we're going to say no dumps on on that parcel. Uh, that's that's also illegal. There's got to be some more uh, uh, rational, reasonable, uh, holistic way that we adopt these maps. So, I think it's appropriate. I hope this answer makes sense. I think it's appropriate to look at the characteristics of individual parcels, but I don't recommend that any map or any overlay be patchwork based off of those parcels, mm -hmm. there should be some holistic general policy reason why this part of town, you know, this part of town is particularly good for these reasons. The parcels all have this attribute. We're going to make the map around there. That's fine. Um, but I, I get nervous when we say, well, parcel A is good, but right next door, parcel B is not good. We you can you can draw your district lines where you like them, but we got to be able to back it up. Thank you. Okay, um, Bob, I'm not sure if your hands up again or or was up from before, and it's down. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, so I think that was my major thought about mapping would just generally be. You can have a preference map that doesn't have the force of law. I, there's, I don't particularly see a problem with that. Um, I would just maybe be cautious. If it's a preference map, it should be very clear that it's a preference map. You know, we can't have a preference map and then the special permit granting authority say, well, it's not consistent with the preference map. We just say as a policy matter, the town, you know, uh, identifies these properties and the, the owners might wish to consider you know, up building solar there because it's good for the town and it's good for the environment. Um, but keeping it clear that it's preference, it's not a requirement, there's no bearing on the administrative permit process. If we would like it to have the force of law, whether we do it as most likely an overlay, I would say, Chris, I don't know why we would do this as a underlying district, but if we do it as an overlay, then we just be mindful of you know, we've identified these groups of parcels in this part of town, and we're going to make this part of the overlay and and, and back it up. Uh, I would just be cautious, Dwayne, to your, your point about parcel level details. You can use the attributes of the parcels, why they're a good fit for the overlay, but I wouldn't suggest saying, well, we pick parcel A out and we don't pick parcel B, especially when they're really close together. Um, it, that's just going to get into a patchwork of messiness both from a legal perspective and an, uh, an administrative perspective. <laughs> um, you know, how do we, you know, it's hard to determine sometimes what, what qualifies and what doesn't. But um, that's, I think, everything I had for mapping, unless there were other. Oh, Chris has a question. Yeah. I just wanted to um, let Jonathan know that we've done a study of land in town that um, we think is feasible for solar. And we hired GZA Engineering to work with us to get that study done. And the study had criteria for mapping pieces of land in certain ways. Um, we made a decision early on to eliminate 
some uh, properties, and those were based on um, whether a property had a conservation restriction on it, whether it was conservation land that was owned by the town, whether it was APR. Um, I think properties that were clearly wetlands and rivers and streams we took out, um, we eliminated. Um, we eliminated railroad tracks and roadways. And so we have this map that has about a third of the town shown as feasible for, um, for solar. And we further applied criteria and the criteria had to do with slope of the land um, aspect, in other words, what direction it was facing, its proximity to uh, three phase um, transmission lines and the capability or the capacity of those transmission lines to accept more power. And then we ranked all of these lands. We based it on a 30 by 30 foot grid. So we have this map, um, which I think is useful, but I guess I'm a little cautious about using it to create a zoning map. So I think we're going to have to, you know, talk about this more. I just wanted to let Jonathan know that this map exists. But um, one of the potential complications, I think we've we've eliminated all UMass owned lands because we can't really tell UMass what to do. Um, and we don't have any zoning control over them. As far as the two colleges go, much of their land is zoned ED zoning district, which, you know, we our zoning bylaw has very little control over land in ED zoning district. But there are other parcels of land that the college is owned that are actually zoned, you know, with the town zoning. Now, this would be a question for Stephanie, and Stephanie may not remember the the exact, um, you know, choices that we made. But I don't remember if GZA eliminated properties that were uh, not in the educational zoning district from consideration. So I guess the windup is that I'm saying that we have we have about a third of the land that's shown on this map that is, quote, you know, feasible for solar. But then there may be other parcels that are owned by Hampshire College or Amherst College that could also be feasible, but they weren't studied. So. I'm not sure exactly why I'm saying this, but it has to do with mapping and our consideration of what is reasonable or what is possible um, for putting uh, solar. And I think we're going to need a lot of help with this from you about how to make choices with regard to these maps. And maybe I'm just putting that out there as a topic for another day, but I think it's worth recognizing that that is a, a struggle that we're going to confront. So that's it. Yeah, and Chris, I think that brings up a good point. And as you're kind of figuring out what types of requirements the bylaw is going to require of people, uh, both permit-wise, whether it's special uh, site plan approval or special permit, uh, but also dimensional requirements. Maybe this is just one idea. I, I don't know what the map looks like, but maybe where this one third of the town is is particularly feasible maybe they have more favorable dimensional requirements to encourage it more or maybe they have less uh rigorous uh approval process or, or whatever it may be to particularly emphasize and maybe the underlying district for most of the town allows solar um but we we particularly em emphasize that these areas of town are, are the most feasible or the most favorable for the reasons stated in the report. And to that end, we give them some maybe more flexibility in their developments. Um, one, one way we could do it, but, but maybe this is a conversation for Chris and I and, and whoever, uh, as, you, as, you, as we continue and we look at these maps and we see, well, how do we best implement, you know, you all I'm sure went out and had retained someone to make this map you know, let's get the most out of it. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's a good point to bring up. Uh, Jack has a question. Yeah, go ahead, Jack. Yeah, I, I just wanted to offer, I, I wish I would have sent it out, but I did kind of gather all the different townwide maps and put them in one document that, I, that I'd like to share with 
uh, the working group and it kind of just, you know, it, it, it does look very confusing because there's, I, I, I drew from the, the, the recent uh, uh, state map study, what's that called? Um, the technical potential for solar? Yeah, the technical potential one. So I got that. And then you know, various zoning maps from the day. And, uh, you know, none of them really match. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a patchwork. And obviously what we did with GZA um, is, is a little more hands-on uh, and, and localized, but, um, you know, but for, for me, I just, um, th there just seems to be a lot going out there that's going to direct a solar developer on what lands are going to be uh uh makes sense for them and you know i i, I just think <laughs> I, same as chris is like how how do we do an offer map you know on a lot by lot basis sort of thing it's just it just seems daunting and that you know the less you know i i think hopefully that we can just you know, rule out the areas that we, that we need to rule out, and then all the other areas just kind of put in the 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 restrictions. And if the lot fits, then it fits, sort of thing. Versus putting that particular lot on a map saying you can't put solar there. You know, but um, yeah, we we haven't got there <laughs> yet. But it's you know implementing a the actual district for this is, I guess, is, is, is coming near, so. All right, thank, thanks, Jack, yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead, Chris. So I have long doubted whether we should, in fact, put on a map where we are allowing solar and where we're not allowing it because I think there are probably a lot of places in town that would lend themselves to solar that we're not really cognizant of. And again, it could be, you know, the university, not the university. Well, yes, the university and the colleges, they own vast tracts of land that, you know, would be potentially very suitable to solar, but we don't have control over them, as I said. And and in the other, um, the other point is that, um, we are facing a climate cliff in a way. So I'm personally reluctant to put a lot of restrictions on where solar can go. I'm more inclined to put in controls over if someone wants to put solar on this property, here's what you have to do to control against you know bad outcomes. And so I just wanted to say that because my my gut feeling is that it's going to be very difficult to put together a map to regulate where solar should go. We can offer our map as um, information about where solar could go, but I think we really should do our regulating in our zoning bylaw. So just making that statement. Thanks, Chris, yeah. Um, let me, before going back to Jack, let me just, confirm um, that we we can have outright restrictions on no solar in certain um, areas that have already been previously um, restricted for other purposes, for example, conservation land, wet wetlands, um, uh, uh, and maybe a few other categories. Is that is that the case? And maybe we've already drafted that into some of the regulations, but there's some some lands um that we have on that we de designate on on our map and are already restricted for certain purposes um through conservation uh conservation restrictions i presume um those are lands that chris are they already out of um bounds for solar development because of the restrictions upon them or do we have to be explicit on that I think that the conservation lands are out of bounds. I think um, many of them are bound by deed restrictions or else the chapter 97 regulations, which Jonathan probably knows a lot more about than I do. APRs are allowed to have 
some amount of solar, but it has to be no more than 200% of the amount that the farmer would use for his operation, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. So um, some of these properties could be potentially used for solar, but um, they're very restricted in the way they can be used. And wetlands couldn't be used yeah, unless, yeah. you know, unless you could mitigate by adding 5,000 square feet of wetland on another property or something. So wetlands are very restricted. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, Jack. You, um, yeah, I just wanted to yeah, say yeah. that what Chris had mentioned about controls versus trying to 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 get a you know a, a zoning map that is precise and uh, for the entire town, it just doesn't it doesn't make sense. Uh, and so I I just wanted to agree with what Chris was saying and the approach with the bylaw that we should you know be taking. Yeah, perfect, Jack. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just throw my hat in that ring as well, <laughs> generally. Um, and even even the, you know, I think we definitely provided that, you know, even in the, the mapping that GZA did, we are not, we we are not solar developers. We don't, this this wasn't looked at from the perspective of a solar developer. Um, uh, we, we would be, you know, reluctant to sort of suggest that that mapping of feasibility um, is something that would, um, uh, um, avoid the, the need for a, a solar developer or others to uh, really do a, a, a site study for a particular site and everything that's on there is feasible is not necessarily going to be feasible for a solar developer and there's other other plots other areas that for some reason because of our general metrics that we use could be feasible but didn't turn out to be feasible so I don't think we should suggest that this is a perfect mapping, uh, but just a general sense. And I'll just add one comment at the end to Chris's point. You know, so, so if we do this not as a map, but just in the underlying district regulations, and we say, you know, whatever it is, just for example, solar is allowed as of right with no, I know this isn't going to be the case, but allowed as of right, no controls, no nothing in the general residential district. Um, but if that's wetlands, even if it's allowed as a right under zoning doesn't mean the solar is going to end up there you know they would have to comply with the wetlands protection act they'd have to comply with if there's a deed restriction on the property that says no no structures no solar they couldn't do it anyway so um, i think if there's concern about particularly sensitive sites that are protected under a separate statutory scheme the underlying district regulation may not be as relevant for those particular parcels so it's just something in general to keep in mind all right, perfect. All right, let's. Uh, I know we're a bit over time with you, Jonathan. So really appreciate you hanging in there if you can. Um, so maybe we can move on to the nexus statement. Um, a couple questions. Yeah, I think this one is is pretty straightforward. Uh, so nexus statement, I think is 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 a very fine idea. I I applaud you all. I think it's a very good thing to include in a bylaw that is isn't normally included or at least isn't comprehensively included these introductory purpose statements. Um, so I think the only question may be worth discussion, not worth, but um, uh, necessitating, necessitating discussion is the C, which is should it be directly rated to the uses that the bylaw seeks to regulate or can it have more broad policy statements? Uh, at a minimum, it should be re directly related to, to particular uses or aspects of the use that you're looking to regulate. Um, so that might be farmland or forest, for example, we talked about earlier. So if there's going to be particular uh, requirements, regulations, additional prohibitions related to those uses, your nexus statement should have some sort of connection to that, you know, some statement about the sensitivity of the land or the, the value it provides to the town or to the Commonwealth or whatever it may be. Um, as to just general policy statements, the one here is the seriousness of climate change. Um, uh, like I said, preferences in, in regards to mapping, you're, you're more than happy, or I, I'm, I'm more than happy for you all to, to, to state your policies, to state your preferences. I almost never strike those. Um, I think the, the thing maybe just to be cognizant of is, you know, this is gonna have to go through a few different more boards before it gets 
um, adopted. So whatever policy statements you do adopt, I, I think should just be generally consistent with how the town as a whole and all the other boards that need to put their hands on this, um, maybe the, the general direction. So um, yeah, I, I have no, no qualms, no concerns about general policy statements about the seriousness of climate change, but at a minimum, whatever your purpose, your nexus statement, whatever you want to call it, it, there should be some direct connection with the aspects of this use that you're seeking to regulate. Great. Thank you, uh, Martha. Yeah. Uh, what about statements that reference our Massachusetts decarbonization roadmap and the goals for 2030 and 2050? Are they helpful to include? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I think if in a direct would they have the sort of the force of law? Would they be something that you could use to help justify a particular thing? So I don't want to say they would have the force of law in the sense that if someone came and sought an application and their application didn't conform to those state plans, I couldn't then rely on that uh, uh, non-compliance as a as a rationale. But if someone challenged the bylaw to say, well, why did the town adopt these regulations? And I can point to your nexus statement and say, well, your honor, there's a climate change process. Look at these state reports, look at the town took into consideration and, and specifically connected the report to this requirement or to the series or set of requirements. That's certainly helpful in <laughs> more than 99% of the bylaws that you know I might have to defend. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I, I would just say, don't expect them, you know, if, if the state report for 2030 or 2050 says something in particular, if you want that to be a requirement, it should be in the bylaw. Um, but as a general purpose statement, rationale for why these reasonable requirements are reasonable, absolutely include them. I think that's great. Great. Any other um, questions for Jonathan on on this? Okay, uh, good. Uh, Chris? Yeah, I guess I have a question about the um, Natural and Working Lands Report, um, which talks about no net loss of farmland or forest. And um, that's an aspirational goal. But um, in terms of how our bylaw should work. Um, how do you think that connects with how our bylaw should work? Um, and I'm thinking, you know, we're specifically talking about solar development here, but there are also other types of development that happen in Amherst, whether they're commercial developments or, um, you know, residential developments. And so we're not, um, looking at uh, right now the state is looking at no net loss of farms and forests as a goal but how can Amherst grapple with that when we know that our residential developments and commercial developments in town often require taking of farmland and forest and should solar be treated differently um, should solar be more rigorously um, controlled because of that resilient lands report? What's your feeling about that and how we can grapple with the things that are brought up in that resilient lands report? Yeah, I think, you know, you, you said the term, you know, aspirational goal. I think that's important to keep in mind to that the reality of any type of development is that, you know, when one new thing comes in, generally there's a loss of the old thing. So that's a, that's a balancing of, um, you know, uses and uh, equity and, and all of that. Um, one way you might tie in your report, we had a discussion about dual use and the, you know, maybe, maybe putting in some sort of provision about extra scrutiny to make sure that dual use was considered. You know, maybe we can point to the, that report, that provision of the report that says, you know, it's the goal of a commonwealth to have no net loss of agricultural land. And we say, well, the town is, that's a, that's a policy decision the town wants to take. And that's why we're putting in this requirement of extra due diligence. Um, you could use that 
as support or in furtherance of reasonable regulations. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you, there's a reality that, you know, there might be net loss of something. Um, but, but then, you know, how do we, how does the town weigh that, you know, is the net loss of agricultural land in, in, in exchange for solar, something the town is comfortable with encouraging, not, not encouraging, um, that may be a, not to not to skirt the question, but I leave policy up to you guys, and I just try to stick to legal. Um, but I, I think if we were, if you wanted to connect those reports or connect those policy reasons expressed in those reports, we we best do that in a way that supports or or directly connects to a regulation that you've you've you're trying to impose. And maybe that's the best way to go about it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great. Um, okay. Um, any last parting words of wisdom for us, uh, Jonathan? But maybe before we go there, um, Jack, you you got your hand up. Yeah. Um, so I have a question with regard to. Um, I mean, for me, I always have viewed you know a, a ground mounted solar development as something that is you know it's it's a it's a twenty or thirty year uh, project. And so like the decommissioning uh, will be covered, but then, and so, you know, and during that time that, that, that there is a solar, for me, it's the, the use of the land from, from a, a resource standpoint um, uh, is, is more close to a pasture or grassland in terms of the soil is relative, relatively undisturbed you know, if, it, if it's a farmland to solar uh, conversion, if it's a forest to solar, that's that's a different. But I'm wondering about at the end of, of the lease, um, how realistic is it to think that um, uh, that this now becomes like an industrial property and it'll be kind of tainted that this is our this is cannot go back to its original use. And that sort of thing. So, um, to, for me, it kind of lessens the blow. Like, when in thirty years, forty years, fifty years, when we have our 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 food needs might be radically different, and lands that are now fallow that will indeed be farmed, uh, but you know haven't you know for the last fifty years haven't been farmed, but but could. I mean, I guess that's a that's a the long you know a prime agricultural soil thing. That's that's the whole nature of that, you know, long thinking. So, how realistic is it that that when the solar lease ends, that it returns and 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 doesn't become, you know, something other than than what we intend it to be? <laughs> I don't know if I'm making sense, Jonathan, but um, you no, know, I, I I think the concern is. You know, we're we're starting to allow these uses that are going to exist for decades. And what's the what's the end result when the useful life of these structures ends? Um, it's like looking into a you know magic ball looking glass. We don't particularly know what the world's going to look like in 30 years. And we also don't know what the makeup of the, the town's going to look like. We don't know what the zoning bylaws are going to look like. So I think if there's a particular concern about what happens at the end? Um, that that might be best achieved in the initial permitting of it. Say, I know Dwayne had brought up soil health, and and you know maybe part of the requirements are, you know, we do yearly inspections to make sure that there's no leaks of I don't even know if if dangerous fluids are used in these types of things. But you know you know there's no leaks or contaminations of the soil. Maybe there's some requirement of a vegetative maintenance plan to make sure that you know the the that the owner is cutting the grass and trimming the trees and all that stuff so that when this use does end um the the property is in some sort of state that someone could make the decision oh we're going to revert it back to agricultural land or um you know it's hard to say too because one of the other things and, and Amherst uh, doesn't have this requirement, but many of the towns that we represent have this MBTA community zoning requirement, which is the eastern part of the state, and that's to address the housing shortage. 
And it's one of those things where maybe in 30 years, Amherst or, or Central and Western Massachusetts have this need for housing and we might convert it not to agricultural land, but housing. It's just one of those things we can, we just don't quite know what it is. Um, but I think if there's a particular concern about, we wanna make sure that land is, the option to use this land uh, is available when the lease ends or the useful life of it, those could be implemented in regulatory requirements now or permitting requirements now that, you know, put in those safeguards um, so that you know, the, the land isn't destroyed or contaminated or anything like that. Great, thank you. Yep. Um, uh, Martha. Yes, I had submitted a question in, via Stephanie to you earlier that uh, is a follow-up really to what we talked about, but the Huey administration is placing a high priority on preserving farmland and the importance of locally grown food. And example, her recent visit after the flood damage out here and providing finances and so on and so forth. Can we use then that as a justification for saying no net loss of farmland in our? So you can certainly use that as a justification for, or a policy reason for adopting the bylaw. When we say as a reason for no net loss, we, we then have to keep in mind that the, the overall guardrails that towns have is shall not prohibit or unreasonably regulate. So we might get into a scenario where we say no net loss, and then someone comes and says, well, you're prohibiting it because I can't, um, you know, I can't provide a, an adequate counterbalance to the loss that's going to occur, or they might say it's on an unreasonable regulation. Um, I, I, like I said, I think in my prior answer, if there's something in particular in these reports uh, that we want to enforce, it needs to be in the bylaw. You can always use reports as a, a rationale or policy reason for adopting it. Um, but if there's either a no net loss or, or, or a lessening of this loss that we want to implement, it should be in the bylaw in some either dimensional or use requirement. Thank you. I have a, a question that, um, uh, so if, if, if um, obviously the, the um, our, zoning restri restriction, particularly some of the design issues and also some of the restrictions on land use is going to uh, sort of be in consist consistent with the state programs. Like when we're talking about agrivoltaics, um, we would be talk we would generally be talking about, you know, if, if we're going to encourage agrivoltaics, it would be agrivoltaics as defined by the state's rules and regulations. Um, how and those, those obviously, our zoning bylaw changes over time, but also those state rules change over time, um, as will most likely there's going to be changes in the SMART program, the solar program under the new administration that, in my mind, will probably, probably make it more encouraging of solar on non-forested farmland, um, uh, in, in my mind, is my, is my complete guess. Um, but... Um, when we reference, um, like if we say in our bylaw that these agri encourage these agrivoltaic projects to be, you know, in, in conformance with the rules and regulations of the DOER uh, rules, um, how do we um, how do we make that sort of evergreen, as they say, in terms of, of um, you know, if the, if the state law changes and it's not to our liking, uh, do we just live with it or, or uh, do we put some caveat in there? Uh, that says, uh, um, you know, if the state law changes, it's it's as of as of the law, uh, as of the state ro ruled in 2023, uh, uh, or how do we deal with that sort of situation? Yeah, that that's a that's an interesting question because I think what we most often see is, you know, projects shall be consistent with all state rules and regulations, and so um, that would mean if the the, the state amends its regulations to something the town doesn't like, you'd have to, as you said, you know, live with it. Um, so if there's a particular aspect of a regulation, the current regulations that you think the town, you know, the town's always going to want to want, those should be explicitly stated in the bylaw. But if we're, we're comfortable with, 
and, and, and you don't need to say this because there's a you have to follow the you know these people applicants landowners they, they need to follow the law anyway so you don't need to say it but i think it's sometimes nice or helpful to say it um, um they're going to need to comply with that with whatever the current bylaw or the current regulations excuse me say um so if there's something in particular in the smart program or in the regulations or in something else that the town thinks we need to separately state it because we want this to be a consistent requirement in the town, it should be spelled out. Uh, otherwise, it's going to, you know, be under the auspice of whatever state regulation, uh, you know, they're operating under. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, excellent. I see no hands, uh, which is good. Um, Jonathan, thank you for your time, for your um, intelligence and your uh, professional guidance. <laughs> um, and um, uh, obviously, you'll be reviewing <laughs> what we come up with at the end of the day. Uh, but also, um, I presume through Chris and, and Stephanie, we may um, have the need to follow up with a, some some questions as we sort of final finalize our recommendations. Uh, obviously, what we put forward are going to be just just recommendations to the town. Uh, but uh, excellent. Really appreciate your insights and, and, and thoughts. Well, then, no, I, I appreciate you inviting me and your time. And um, I appreciate the questions. Certainly, if there's any more questions, feel free to send them to me and I'll I'll do my best to answer them. If you'd like me to come back, I'm, I'm available at your your pleasure. Just let me know. Um, and then uh, when the bylaw comes down the line or if Chris and Stephanie, we want to chat offline before then, just just let me know and I'll, and I'll make it happen. All right, excellent. Okay, nice, thank nice you so to see much. You all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, excellent. Um, okay, I uh, hope those hands weren't for Jonathan. Um, all right, Stephanie, go ahead. This is a quick procedural thing. Just wondering if you want to take a quick five minute break because this is a long meeting. I was going <laughs> to suggest that as well. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, before we do, before we uh, um, move on that, Martha, did you have? Yeah, I just wanted to request, Stephanie, can you send to our, around to all of us what was uh, displayed here of Jonathan's answers to the questions? I already did. I just did. And it's also posted online in the meeting packet for the public. I was just doing that. Yeah. Oh, OK, because it hadn't it hadn't been before. Yeah, right. I, I was out yesterday, so I apologize. That's OK. And what about the questions that uh, Janet and I had, had submitted to you earlier? They were all included. They, will they be answered and eventually all right, written answers just sent to us? So what I had done, I think I sent you all the packet of questions. Yes. Um, and everything was combined into one document. Yes. And that was sent to Jonathan. So his responses were to the entire packet that I sent. I don't think, I think he was maybe, um, maybe sort of, consolidated some of the questions into like a category. I don't think he went through one by one because I did forward it to him. And what I sent you was the most recent. He'd sent me initial responses. Then he saw the additional questions. And what I sent you was the second version of his responses, if you're uh, following me. That's so, what you just sent out. Uh, yes. And right. Okay, so thanks, thanks yeah, a lot. Yeah. And, right. and I apologize. I was out Wednesday and Thursday. No, no apologies. That's just that's fine. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, everybody good with a, um, a short break, uh, and then we'll convene and, and uh, we'll get through the updates and then, and then uh, get into the, um, uh, the bylaw, particularly with regard to the farming farmland framework. Um, so uh, my thought is maybe uh, 1210 to reconvene. Is that okay? Nine minutes or do you want 1215? I was even going to say five minutes, <laughs> so five minutes. it's up to you. Let's go with 1210, eight, eight minutes, okay? <laughs> 1210, we'll reconvene. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dwayne. Don't, don't leave, uh, just <laughs> turn your camera off.
All right, it's 1210. So if you're back, if you could let me know, that'd be great. Awesome. I see people are eating lunch. Is it appropriate to eat? In other words, may I eat my lunch? It's more more like nuts and chocolate for me, but oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. I could put uh, I could you know blank my face out when I'm not talking. I'm I'm good with anybody eating lunch however they like. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, Laura, I see your hand up. So, um, not sure if that was left over, but um, oh yeah, that's left. No, no, that's okay. not my hand, is it? Uh, I see your hand. Well, you're oh, weird. Virtual okay. hand. No. Okay, let's put that down. Good. All right, perfect. Okay, um, great. So let's move on. Uh, and first, uh, thank you, Stephanie and Chris, for setting that up with uh, with Jonathan. That was really helpful, um, and I think actually quite pertinent to our um, conversation uh, that we'll embark on shortly um, on farmlands, and and then um, subsequently on forest land. Before we do that, uh, following up on the agenda following through on the agenda. Um, let's first have any staff updates, um, Stephanie or Chris. I don't have anything relevant, um, so All right. I defer to Chris. And, and Chris, you yep. go. Um, yeah, I you. presented a sort of an outline of what we've been working on to the um, planning board the other night and Martha was able to attend, so that was helpful. Um, and we just talked about what GZA had accomplished for us in terms of um, mapping. And we also kind of ran quickly through the zoning bylaw as it's been drafted to date. And we talked about some of these sticky wickets that we're dealing with now with regard to um, farmland and forest. So the planning board has a good sense of where we are with the project. Um, so I think, you know, when we're eventually able to bring them a final product, they'll be ready for it. I would s suggest that um, we bring them, you know, keep them up to speed or keep them up to date as we go along. So we don't just end up with something that's, you know, brought to town council and then referred to the planning board. I think it's worthwhile to keep them, you know, knowledgeable about where it is we are with this project. So I plan to keep doing that as time goes on. I wanted to um, make a request, and I haven't talked to Stephanie about this or Dwayne or any of you, but um, it appears to me that uh, September 1st may not be a realistic date for delivering a draft. And um, so we should talk about that. And, you know, what is it today? Today is the 5th of, of August. Fourth, yeah. our, uh, fourth. Um, so our next meeting would be 18, the 18th of August, <laughs> around there. Um, so either we have to start meeting more often or we have to, to, you know, tell the town manager that we think we need a little more time. So I don't know if other people are thinking that way too, but, you know, that's something that I'd like to talk about. Great. Um, yeah, that's been on my mind as well. Um, um, uh, so let's let's leave a little bit of time for that at the end of today. Um, seeing as next time may be our penultimate meeting, and then we're um, I think could squeeze in one more in August. Uh, I think on the calendar. Um, I'd have to check. Um, but um, no, I guess the next one is actually falls into uh, is our deadline on uh, September 1st. Um, uh, so yeah, that's that's uh, important. Um, well, let's let's do you want to have a brief discussion about that at this point with with the group? I mean, um, I guess it's also um, is the willingness of of the working group members to stay engaged uh, for another month or so. Um, and um, I guess that's one question that we don't have everybody, but would, would um, and I guess also the willingness of the town manager to uh, uh, accept our request for another month 
<clears throat> is what I would would suggest. Um, use September, the, the two or three meetings in September uh, to really tie things up in a, in a coherent um, draft for delivery and try to get through farmlands today and forests next time. Um, so um, any feed, that would be my proposal, would be to ask the manager, the town manager for a, uh, an, an extra month. Um, and um uh and then and then um hope there's willingness of the members to uh continue together for another month so can i hear uh any thoughts on on that idea hey. uh, martha and then stephanie yes i i certainly would favor extending it for another month i mean i i think it's much better to get it right than get it fast and it would be just too stressful to try to you know, somehow meet every week or cram everything in for the next month. I'd much rather prefer our continued every two weeks with time to think in between and try to just make sure we. <coughs> All right, great. Um, Stephanie. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I um, can certainly put that forth to the town manager if you want to have an actual date though, maybe give him October 1st as the date or whatever you all decide. Yep, thank you. Yep, Laura. Yeah, I think my only thought is, I mean, I think at this point, it's not a question of, you know, should we extend it? It's like, clearly we're going to need to extend. Um, but I but I also, I think one of the, one of the things I've noted with this, um, you know, with this uh, group is that we, we tend to go off into tangents and to dig deeply and we haven't actually been focused on this bylaw. So I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm struggling to make these meetings in the summertime just because there's, um, you know, children all over the, over the place and plans. Um, so I'm in favor of extending as long as we can all really commit to just writing the bylaw now. Like we've, it feels as though we've researched everything high and low. There'll always be more avenues to pursue um, but at some point, we just need to take the pen and get it done. Yep. Thank you, Laura. I wholeheartedly agree with that. And I think basically getting through the framework of farmlands and forests are probably the key things. And then that would enable Chris and her team to write us a draft. Uh, uh, okay, uh, Bob. Yeah, um, I Laura kind of preempted what I was going to say. I think, unfortunately, it's inevitable we need an extension. But I agree, we have been talking and talking and talking without any progress. We really need to focus on the bylaw, what's reasonable, and to stop all this discussion about restrictions and other things that you know interest people and would be great in an ideal world. But as Chris once said, we're going to have to deserve some land to put in solar, and we just have to accept that and go on. Great. Okay. So... Um... Jack, did you have a, another comment? No, I just want to concur with with what's being said. So, um, looking forward to, to getting that draft and presenting it to all the other parties. Great. So, um, I would like to suggest we move forward with um, Stephanie um, requesting or asking the town manager for an extension till October first. Um, and that we continue to convene through through September. We might even think about meeting weekly, potentially, uh, in September uh, to get this done. Uh, but we'll we can deal with that later. But is that um, uh, and and I didn't hear anybody who would not be willing to serve for the rest of the of, of September for September. Um, so is that sound okay? Do we? I'm not sure if we need a formal motion or or just con, uh, a con. con Occurrence with what uh, was just said, Stephanie. I was just going to suggest you just put it to an official vote. Okay, so uh, the motion uh, would be to ask Stephanie to ask the town manager for an extension of this solar working bylaw uh, to uh, October first, twenty twenty three. 
And uh, I think that's the extent of what we formally have to move. Um, I think we can, on a caveat would be that we work diligently uh, for, the, for, for the remaining time strictly on getting the bylaw language uh, framework and language uh, put into place. Do I hear a second? I'll okay. second, but the um, the actual day would be September 29th. That would be three more meetings. October 1st is a Sunday. Yeah, let's uh, look at that. Um, yeah. You could make it the following Friday. Sorry, Martha. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, you could give us a little time after that last meeting <laughs> to get the report. Final. So that would be uh, October, time. October 6th. Yeah, the first Friday in October, basically. So October 6th. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so with that amendment, uh, yeah, we had a second. And um, I think we need your cameras on for the voice vote. Yes. Okay, Laura, can you turn your camera on too? <laughs> yeah, hang on. Thanks. No, no, I'm there. not camera worthy. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I'm like shoving a we, bagel. We won't judge. Face. We don't judge. <laughs> well, I probably popped it in my mouth. <laughs> no. Okay, so in no particular Hi. order. <laughs> um, Breger? Yes. Jemsek? Sorry about that. Yes. Hanner? Yes. Brooks? Reluctantly, yes. <laughs> Pagliarulo. Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Okay. Um, let's move on. Well, are there any um, committee updates um, that are real pertinent? Otherwise, I'd like to get to the bylaw. Great. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I think what would be helpful is to look at um, the framework for so, uh, uh, zoning bylaw, not so much on language that then Chris and her team would draft, but setting up this framework for how we would approach zoning on farmland um, that was distributed uh, by Stephanie. Um, as a solar bylaw working group framework for farm for farms. Um, I'd like to look at ver version two, which I sent out later, um, uh, which seemed to be a better starting point. So um, with apologies, Stephanie, I'm in a situation where I can't really share my screen so much because um, I got zooming on one computer and everything else is on another computer. <laughs> Um, so it might be a. I've, be I've got you. No worries. I'm just getting it yeah, on yeah, the yeah, screen now. Um, and it was interesting because uh, some of the issues that we talked to Jonathan about were um, uh, uh, um, critical here, or applicable certainly. And let me say that. Um, um, well, this got my name attached to it, um, and I'll take credit for trying to draft out some of the uh, these beginning requirements. Um, uh, Martha provided the drafting of the um, soil preservation requirements, um, and then the nexus statements that follow after that. Um, I'd like to focus on the these requirements first. And this was brought up by Jonathan. Okay, is it's like, okay, what is the set of um, land uh, that would be um, applicable for these um, zoning restrictions, if you will, with regard to, 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 to uh, the farmland. Um, and then we go into a bit with what those restrictions would be or requirements would be with regard, particularly with regard to farm um, uh, source, uh, soil uh, preservation, um, uh, as well as design features. Um, and so uh, let me start with the um, the first part, and then and then maybe um, uh, happy to have Martha lead us through her portion with regard to the soil um, uh, soil requirements. 
Um, Chris, did you have a, a thought first? Why don't you go ahead and read it and then I'll give you my thought. Okay, okay, great. Um, okay, so the, um, and this is not, this language is not meant to be um, necessarily bylaw language, uh, but uh, sort of the, the, uh, the, the more English version that would have to be then translated into more formal uh, bylaw version, uh, language. Uh, but the idea here is, okay, so for the provisions, restrictions on active farmland, prime farmland, and farmland of statewide importance, this first um, really pretty simple uh, two statements here uh, really get at what Jonathan sort of brought forward in terms of, okay, what are the lands that are, are uh, subject to this area of the, of the uh, bylaw? Uh, and so this would be um, on land. Uh, that has been in active farming for the past five years. Perhaps that needs to be defined, but maybe not, uh, but has been in active farming for the past five years and is prime farmland or farmland of statewide importance. Um, the proposed solar project must be an agrivoltaic array meeting the ASTGU eligibility in the state solar program. So already, you know, based on what Jonathan, we discussed with Jonathan, I think we need to yeah. um, rethink uh, some of this, but the idea was that uh, it wouldn't be for all sites in Amherst that have uh, prime farmland or, or uh, farmland of statewide importance because there's many areas in Amherst that have those, have those good soils, uh, but are not anywhere close to being in active farming, like my house came up, um, uh, but but many of our other houses probably, um, and, and many other parts of town that are uh, really not, not at all farmed, and including uh, many of our forested areas. Uh, but for those areas that are um, these good soils and is, an act, and is in active farming for the past five years, then um, as written here, the idea would be to um, require those solar projects that um, are being proposed for those situations to be dual use projects. Um, let me, we'll get back to that in a moment, uh, but then the second paragraph uh, is that for all land uh, that is prime farmland, uh, prime farmland or farmland of state importance, uh, regardless of whether it's currently used for farm, for uh, uh, regardless of its current use or coverage, meaning if, even if it's not in active farming, um, then the soil preservation requirements provided below would be required uh, again, so that the soils are kept intact, well intact, uh, so that after the 20, 30 years of the solar array uh, and it's decommissioned, and the land the land uh, could be um, used uh, that the, the the good soil qualities are not degraded uh, so that it could go into farming or 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 other purposes but farming would remain an option um, <clears throat> so um, that uh, going back to the first paragraph um, you know I think we heard from from uh, Jonathan that this restriction or requirement may be too restrictive. Um, and so, uh, unless we want to be bold and uh, 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 go beyond uh, what Jonathan may be comfortable with defending, we're able to, to defend um, for the town. Um, but uh, let me get some thoughts on that. Obviously, with the 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 uh, the thought that we may think about that more in terms of not a requirement but an encouragement uh, through some. Um, demonstration that dual use was considered, uh, but turned down uh, for various reasons. And, and we had a conversation that Chris brought up with Jonathan on that, uh, that we could incorporate. Uh, but before we get into then the soil requirements, design requirements, let me just uh, get some thoughts and, and feedback uh, and comments on this um, applicability, I guess, uh, statement of, of what this uh, what this would um, refer to. All right, uh, Chris. 
So I was just going to suggest that um, there be a second part to that sentence, mm -hmm. such that I don't have it completely worked out in my head, but um, unless the uh, applicant receives a waiver from the permit granting authority um, as a result of um, demonstrating that they have considered uh, agrivoltaics on this property and uh, have found for, for technical or financial reasons that it doesn't work, something to that effect. Yeah, yeah. And and you, um, to Jonathan's point, maybe leave the, leave it somewhat, no, I wouldn't say vague because Jonathan <laughs> said there's concerns about vagueness too, but um, leave it a little bit open so that they can um, uh, make that demonstration to the PGA, uh, but the PGA has plenty of discretion to ask for more information um, and, and more demonstration. Um, okay, yeah, I, I would agree uh, certainly with that based on what our conversation with, with Jonathan uh, just now. So Martha? Yes, I, I agree. I think all it needs is one more sentence along the lines of what Chris said. I think you and Chris could probably just draft a sentence that would work. Yeah. Okay. Okay, any other thoughts on, on this um, approach? Yep, Bob. Yeah, I don't agree with the word must. Um, okay. Regardless of what you're gonna add afterwards, I think we can strongly recommend or prefer or whatever, prioritize. I cannot vote for the word must. Okay, I, I think given the additional sentence um, that we're gonna be adding, um, I think must is probably not appropriate either uh, because it, it isn't must. Uh, it is um, encouraged um, uh, or it, it, you know, it may, maybe it's, it, 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 it must consider um, agrivoltaics, but I, I agree, Bob, that the, that word is, is not, is um, um, not applicable anymore because of the, the, the uh, additional um, caveat, I guess. All right, any other thoughts on that? Okay, and any other thoughts on, on the second part where, um, you know, regardless of whether the land has been actively farmed or not, if it is prime soils uh, or in statewide important soils um, that, um, uh, that, well, we'll have to get, we'll get to the soil preservation requirements in a moment, but that, that uh, there is additional um, scrutiny or, or requirements uh, with regard to taking care of the soils. All right. All right, good. Okay, so maybe we can, um, uh, okay, so then we, we go down to um, the requirements for regarding uh, soils and reporting. I think I added this one introductory sentence, Martha, and then we can go into the your, your language here, but uh, that basically the following soil preservation requirements and design and reporting requirements shall apply to all solar projects. Um, I parenthetically said over 250 kilowatts. Um, I think that's what this whole bylaw refers to. So I don't know if we need that uh, or or it's a, or maybe it's to uh, all. Um, and Chris came up with a new acronym, which I'm blocking on for for these types the, the scale project, commercial scale project. Um, that is installed on prime farmland or farmland of statewide importance. The requirements shall be demonstrated by the applicant. And this, yeah, th this is helpful for us to discuss. It should be demonstrated for the applicant either through submission prepared specifically for the PGA or by providing comparable demonstration through submissions of application and qualification material to the state solar program. I guess, and I'm not sure if that language is quite precise enough, but the idea here was that um, particularly on these uh, good soil soil areas, uh, which also come up in the state solar um, solar uh, uh, incentive program, um, that there are requirements that the applicant needs to provide to the state demonstrating uh, certain requirements um, uh, with regard to soil protection and so forth. Um, and I don't know, but potentially maybe, for example, soil testing uh, that we'll get into in a moment. Um, I just wanted to suggest that for to, to not overly burden um, the applicant, uh, be the landowner or the solar developer, by submitting 
or, or you know, even, you know, I don't want to get into the situation where, where we're asking, the town is asking for a specific soil test um, and the state's asking for another soil test, but they're a little bit different from each other and they have to do two different tests, uh, even though they're kind of similar uh, for similar purposes. Um, I don't want to overburden folks on that. So the idea was to craft some language that provided that um, that if the if the applicant is providing comparable information uh, to the state, that that could be copied to the town um, uh, and, and not uh, not uh, created specifically and exclusively for the town. Um, OK, so any thoughts or questions about that sort of introductory paragraph and then we can go through the requirements. Um, Great, Martha. Yeah, I thought that was a it was a good um, and good specific introductory paragraph. I was just suggesting one single wording change in the last sentence to make it really clear that what's submitted to the state then really does have to be submitted to the PGA. So by saying uh, either by submission prepared specifically for the PGA or by providing comparable demonstration to the PGA based on the submissions of the application and qualification materials to this state solar program. Just some language that makes it clear that, that you know, once they've done that state application, it's got to go to the PGA. So the PGA has, you know, the full information. Of course, the PGA is not going to uh, make requirements like, gee, we think you should grow broccoli instead of squash, or we think that you should raise the height of the panels by two feet. Uh, but the PGA would still have then uh, the, the, the full information and full authority to say something about the fencing or the setbacks or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So, good. I don't know if you like my wording. I sent it to you, Dwayne. But yeah, you know, yeah, and I, I apologize. I didn't get that yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and remind me, Martha, did that go to Chris as well? Yeah. Okay. So Chris has that language um, as well. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you for that, Bob. Yeah, I apologize. I don't recall, but don't we have in the already part we've already worked uh, language about soil conservation site pre preparation? It, I think I would say, well, these are in addition to what we require just as for any site. I, okay. I don't remember what we had, but some of these seem very familiar. Yeah, good good point. Yep. Yeah, and I think we can cross check that as we get into the full document um, uh, and make sure it's appropriate. Yeah, so these would be a, what we want. He, we want um, the general soil protections to be applicable to everything, but then in this section, we want to have um, the requirements that would be additional uh, for soils that are prime or of statewide importance. All right. Okay, good. Um, shall we go down the list of soil require preservation requirements? All right, good. Um, and Martha, do you want me to just keep going down, uh, uh, fully acknowledging that these were um, it, th this was your language? <laughs> Up to you, whichever you prefer. Why don't I just keep going? Um, yeah, but, maybe but... I should just make a, a comment that I took these all from our uh, presentations we had uh, in June, particularly Jake Marley's uh, specific discussions and then the requirements that uh, come from the state, from the SMART program and so on. And you know that document that was from KIPP, somebody or other that Jack forwarded to us, I took them and I just tried to make them consolidated and very concise. And then I read it, ran it by Jake Marley and he approved of the what was written and said he thought it covered the basis. So that's all. Thank you, Martha. And and um, um, some of these, I'm not an expert on what DOER all requires and MDAR requires on on uh, so, uh, soils um, for prime farmland and so forth. Some of these may be covered, uh, but um, again, if, if we state that, um, they can 
demonstrate demonstrate these uh, these requirements by submitting information that they submit to the state. That's that's fine, and there may be more stuff that the state uh, requires. But anyhow, okay. So um, the first thing is to conduct a baseline soil health analysis by qualified professional prior to construction. Um, there may be a requirement to, to sort of, or maybe a need to be a little bit more specific there in terms of what the what baseline soil health analysis, um, what that is. Um, uh, we might be able to ask ask. Uh, somebody with expertise in that area, uh, what, what that would be, um, Jake might know, or, or Jerry Palano, for example. Uh, but generally, the idea here would be to have some um, record of what the baseline soils were um, prior to construction. Um, I know that, amongst other things, compaction of soils, um, and that would be part of this uh, soil health um, testing, I would imagine. Uh, that compaction is uh, is something that is um, particularly for prime uh, soil. We might want to be encouraging or requiring uh, that due diligence is taken to try to minimize that uh, during construction. But um, any thoughts on this? Great. Um, two is, um, uh, uh, and I think I I tried to do some. Combining of and indentations, uh, Martha, of of what I got from your your draft. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the next would be and submit plan uh, for minimizing soil disturbance during construction, including grading, compaction, soil removal, soil replacement, um, and part of that demonstration of minimizing soil disturbance would be um, a plan that would avoid grading. Um, cuts and fills, topsoil removal. Um, some of this, I think, may be in our more general bylaw, uh, but we'll have to go back and double check. Um, no addition of off-site soil without prior approval from the PGA. PGA. Um, yeah, keep in mind that if this is, in, if this, well, yeah, okay, okay. If it's inactive farming, it's probably fairly flat <laughs> um, yeah. already, but if it is if it is a forest land, for example, that we do allow to be cut, but it's prime soils, uh, then and, and there's a lot of stump removals and stuff like that. Um, uh, some of this may be important in terms of trying to uh, do that with minimal disturbance and removal of of topsoils and uh, of the good soils and so forth. Um, okay. Um, uh, uh, existing level field areas left without disturbance. Um, yeah, generally, I think solar developers would be want to keep level areas level <laughs> in, in any case. Um, where soils need to be leveled uh, or smoothed, such as filling potholes or leveling. This shall be done with minimal overall impact with all displaced soils returned to the areas affected. Yeah, I'm not sure about that last part, whether that's, is that doable? If it's displaced soils, <laughs> if you're sort of smoothing things out, moving soils from one spot to another uh, by the very nature of displacing some soil to fill it in somewhere else. So you're not really returning it um, later. So I'm not too clear on that. Yeah, I copied it from some, some yeah, from okay. these documents, but you know, instead of leaving all that good soil in a pile at the edge of the property, somehow it was, uh, okay. it, maybe there's better words to say it. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, uh, temporarily halt, halt use of heavy construction equipment during and following heavy rains when soils are saturated. Um, that seems reasonable. I'm not sure if there needs to be more definition around that. What qualifies for a heavy rain uh, or how long to wait. Uh, but um, 
Um, yeah. And some of that, some of this may be covered in our other construction requirements with regard to storm runoffs and so forth. Yeah, and I think it was something that Jake uh, emphasized too. The idea simply being that you know that's when the soil compaction happens and so on, and it's just yeah. a flag. It should be obvious when the soils are saturated and when they've dried out for a couple of days, or you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, um, yeah. Okay. So that's that for the uh, for sort of the soil disturbances. Any thoughts or questions on that? Um, again, I think we'll sort of ask Chris to sort of take this and convert it into language that is appropriate. Um, and then we can take a look at that as a um, document again. Um, yep, go ahead, anybody? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, Jack. Yeah, I'm just wondering uh, for Chris, I mean, does, does this look familiar? I mean, in terms of just say a subdivision goes in, this is all kind of, you know, requirements that in terms of uh, site preparation and, and good, you know, best management practices for any site. Are we reinventing the wheel here, I guess, is what I'm asking. My understanding is that there aren't specific requirements for subdivisions um it's usually you know strip the topsoil do the grading when you're finished you bring the topsoil back in and you plant so there aren't um requirements about um you know not leveling areas there aren't requirements about displaced soils um so i i don't think that this this is regulated by subdivision um, regulations. It may be regulated by best practices with regard to wetlands, uh, areas around wetlands, but not not in general. All right. Um, okay. And um, I know Laura's taking notes, but if any of this sounds um, familiar and best practices to solar developers anyhow would be fine and great doesn't mean and I think we should still have it but if, if any of it sounds like really hard or, or confusing uh, or infeasible for solar developers uh, do let us know from your perspective um I think it's I think it's totally fine to say, um, to require uh, the minimization of soil disturbance, especially compacting soil. Um, I think that we just want um, to see their plan, basically. I think that's what it's all going to come down to. Is it you want to see what their what their um, plan will be? I'm not sure about salts. I don't. I don't actually know. It's used in construction. Yeah, yeah we're getting into that, that one. That one I, I never heard of that either. But um. I could I could say I ran this by a conservation biologist mm -hmm. who had contacted us because he's going to be moving to Amherst, but he's in California, and he has had experience reviewing solar projects in California, and he brought that up. He said that in many cases, and maybe that's just unique to California that developers tend to use these uh, soil stabilizers to keep the dust down. And he said that those <laughs> often contain salts, you know, sodium chloride maybe, potassium chloride and so on that really are kind of toxic for the soil or mm. and so on. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. He's, the one, he's <laughs> the one that suggested putting that in. And so yeah. if it's never used around here anyway. Sure. You know, yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen it. The only the only thing I'm not sure about is um I don't I'm trying to think of that last bullet there on, on mounting. So mounting ballast screw type push and push. Um yeah, I mean I think listen, all of this is I, as long as we're saying like this is a if there's a reason why they cannot do something, we just kind of 
And we're not saying no. We just want to know why certain development techniques would not be utilized, right? Yeah. Like, I, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, that's, um, I guess, on first going back to the soil stabilizers, uh, salts, I, I guess to the extent that it's not really a practice here, um, one could argue it's not really needed, uh, but at the same time, it probably doesn't hurt to have sure. it. Um, so, though it may cause some head scratching, but <laughs> but um, but I guess it doesn't hurt to have it. Um, uh, okay, yeah. On so on the mounting, um, the idea here again. Keep in mind, this is not required for all solar development in, yeah. Paris, but for that in prime soils uh with yeah yeah no that makes yeah no that makes sense i'm just thinking about the times when you can't do that and honestly like the only that uh -huh. i'm getting some strange like we're getting some strange questions in the solar space now regarding like these changes in climate and how construction's taking place and how farms are going i mean it's really bizarre how farms are going to be constructed to ensure they can withstand strong winds or yeah. in areas where we never had to construct farms um, with that consideration before all all kinds of new things are emerging that I had never thought I would see like how to protect against massive hail how to you know so you know as long as yes I think prime soil is fine and I think all, all of that is fine but it's a it's a new world folks it's a new world yeah okay yeah um Okay, so good. Um, okay, so we sort of covered the mounting, no concrete, asphalt, all that stuff. So that basically, after the 20, 30 years, this all this material can be readily removed um, so that the soils could be, um, the land could be used readily um, for for farming or, or other purposes. Um, okay. Um, uh, Martha also suggests uh, repeat soil analysis after construction is complete to ensure soil quality has not been degraded or duly unpacked. Uh, final permit granted only after soil certification by qualified professional. Um, I guess I, I offhand I don't really have an issue with that. I guess it you know does that does that create too much uncertainty for a solar developer <laughs> uh, of going through the whole construction pro process and then not yeah. knowing at the end of the day. I mean, I mean, this can't be subject. If you, I mean, listen, that'll never pass a financing test. That can't be a requirement for, yeah. you know, keeping the farm. I mean, you can ask for it, but it can't have any teeth to it. Um, because otherwise you're just like that requirement there means you'll never develop a solar farm. Yeah, I, I, I guess I just kind of um, tossed it in for discussion or something. I think just an overall question to me of our, of our whole zone law is, is there any enforcement or what is the enforcement? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, <laughs> that's just a bigger question for somewhere in the bylaw of, uh, how do we put teeth in any of the requirements or so? Yeah, so is there any, um, I mean, there's obviously um, a teeth and enforcement at the beginning that they show a plan that is uh, passes muster uh, uh, for all this. Um, obviously there's other parts of the bylaw that has rules and regular rules with regard to construction process um, and and um, on-site inspections uh, allowed and so forth. Um, so I'm wondering if that's sufficient. Uh, I guess I would be a little bit concerned about yeah. you know requiring a test and the compaction comes out a little bit uh, <laughs> over uh, and maybe it's, you know, you don't get a right sample size, uh, and, uh, and all of a sudden, yeah, I guess to Laura's point, not, not, not are the developers, uh, uh, have a project that doesn't get permitted, but they won't get permitted to begin with, uh, because of this requirement, um, and uncertainty, uh, that, that they, they're facing at somewhat discretion of a, of a PGA that, 
um, they they don't know. <laughs> well, maybe so, we could uh, take about the the, the Chris, yeah. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, yeah Chris, yeah. did you have any? Um, yeah. Are there any comparable things in zoning that deal with this sort of thing? There are um, times when you have to have certain tests done or certain things need to be accomplished before you can get your final certificate of occupancy or your final yeah. certificate of completion. So we could try to figure out how to word this so that it makes sense for this type of project. Maybe Laura has some yeah, I guess, suggested I guess, wording. Yeah, I guess my question is what's the, what's the cure? So let's say that something comes back, not as, you know, not as what we, you know, in a way we wouldn't want to, you know, it's too compact or soil doesn't, you know, what, what's the cure for, um, for this? Yeah. If you had several acres, you know, 20 acres, 30 acres of solar arrays, I don't really know what the cure would be. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you so can't, we, we can't put anything in here that doesn't have a cure because it's not as though it's not a wetland. Um, if you if you put something without a cure, then you're just not. It's the equivalent to a ban, because if someone makes a mistake, it means that your the entire array is not going to be approved at the end of the day, right? I mean, that's essentially. Can I? I I'm sorry, I can't find my raise hand function, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was just thinking. Sorry, I'll put myself on. Um, you know, similar to wetlands, I was just thinking, could you have some kind of um almost like a third party review that, that this was developed according to plans, which I think is probably gonna happen some point during the process anyway, wouldn't that include the soils? So could there be just sort of a verification that the project was built according to the plans by like a independent reviewer? Yeah, I guess, my, but that doesn't necessarily address the question of if we said, we wanted to make sure that you know compaction was of a certain point you know i'm not sure how you measure that yeah and then it's not then what do we do we're, we're saying the project wasn't built in accordance to design and we're not going to accept it like what's the what is the remedy there right yeah i guess i'm thinking of, of kind of gross things if some but if the contractor decided to just bring in and dump a whole lot of gravel to even things out or i think of the case on cape cod where there was a oh yeah listen and yeah. they extracted a whole lot of sand oh. to sell and then it ended up oh yeah the town's water supply and oh so no yeah no you're, you're talking about egregious stuff yeah no i get it i get it martha yeah um, so i'm thinking maybe maybe this that kind of point belongs more when we talk about the oversight during construction you know i think we're somewhere else yeah weekly monitoring or yeah you know, this and this and that and and maybe we just may need to make sure that in yeah. that section um you know if it's farmland that they monitor mm -hmm. for certain things as we go along yeah i think that's good lawns. do you think that would be better yeah i i think that's i think that's very reasonable um i think that's very reasonable because now i understand what you're trying to what you're trying to prevent yeah um, so so maybe we could you know flag this for for chris for you know, making our master <laughs> trapped here, but you take it out of here and and put it somewhere under the construction or, or or something. Or or make a statement that these things should be monitored during construction or something like that. You know, rather than, you know. I whatever. think that's a good suggestion. Yep. Yeah. Great. Okay. Great. Um, did I see somebody else's hand? No. All right, super. Okay, um, so let's go on to the. Or, or, or before we go on, is there any other uh, sort of um, soil requirements, soil protection requirements that we seem to be missing that anybody come up with, Jack? Yeah, I get you know again. I'm just uh, don't want to reinvent the wheel, and I I do notice that the. Pioneer Valley Planning Commission uh, in their document, Solar Best Practices has preserved and managed topsoil and soil porosity section, page huh. 48, which I think Chris uh, should lift uh, what's appropriate from that. Yeah, good thinking. Yeah. Good point. Mm -hmm. 
It, All right. Can I raise my hand real quick? Yeah, go ahead, Laura. Okay, sorry. Um, it's hard for me to take notes and raise my hand. Um, <laughs> one, one, one possible cure, because, you know, I mean, if, if someone, you know, if a developer made a mistake and topsoil wasn't um, what we wanted at the end of the day, can you bring in new topsoil? Yeah. I mean, can they pay to bring it in? I, I have no idea, guys. This is not my specialty. So tell me if this is a thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I guess I'm saying like you could give them a certain time period and say, yep, we're going to prove this as long as you are bringing in equivalent, whatever that is within six months or, or you know, yeah. whatever that might be. And that and that that could be the cure we're looking for. Yeah. Let's, let's think about that. I'm. Uh, does it mean if you're bringing in topsoil, you're removing it from somebody, somebody else? Yeah, so, I, I don't know. No. <laughs> Remember that 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 but put in in the first part was that you know bringing in topsoil or bringing in any kind of soil with the approval of the PGA, so the PGA said, could say, oh, okay, whose property did you dig that out of if they want to? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but it, it still could be done with that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think we want to look at that a little bit or th consider that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, okay, uh, Jack? Yeah, I, I guess I'm a little confused <laughs> with regard uh, to bringing in topsoil. Um, if it's farmland, you're not going to get any better soil and you're not going to want to, you know, reclaim i mean you're, you're going to sacrifice area the access roads are the access roads and you're going to sacrifice that as as a disturbed area um and then other you know appurtenances like the battery storage area and things like that will be uh lost but i'm not understanding you know the 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 need for import of soil um in our discussion here. Yeah, go, go ahead, Bob. I was gonna say, yeah. oh, I, oh, sorry. Sorry, Laura. No, you're just inviting um, opportunity for invasive species introductions. I would mm -hmm. avoid introduction of any extraneous soils. And at the very top there, you said some avoiding. Does avoid meaning no, or does avoid mean it's allowed under, up at the top there? I tried to comment before, but. No one would recognize me. Anyway, I would I would not want soils brought in, top soils or whatever. Okay, that's a good point in terms of uh, importing um, disease or invasive species. Yep, Laura. Laura, did you have um, a... Yeah, yeah, I just would like my comments struck from the record. <laughs> Okay. As someone, as someone who does not know anything about that particular subject matter. So uh, this is where, uh, again, not my subject expertise. Okay, good. All right. So struck. You're the one taking minutes anyhow. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, okay. So let's move on. I do want to, um, we have about 10 more minutes before we want to um, open it up for some public comment uh, or thoughts. Um, so the, this next section, which is on design and reporting requirements, some of this we may have to rethink uh, to the extent that we're not necessarily requiring dual use, uh, but uh, in some cases where it's already active um, farmland, in, uh, providing some encouragement for dual use. Um, but we have here, um, <clears throat> uh, the plan should submit should be submitted detailing the types of crops to be planted and how the site will be monitored for the first five years in order to make adjustments to improve crop yields. Uh, again, this would be relevant only for those projects that have been encouraged and decide to move forward with mm -hmm. agrivoltaics. Um, I will say this is a requirement by the state for dual use, uh, but the idea here would be that that information also makes its way to the town.
Um, the second is <clears throat> substitution of other agricultural uses such as grazing on prime land currently being used for food crops shall not be allowed unless an equal or larger acreage of prime farmland is brought into growth of food crops. Um, I think to my just my sense there is that there are protections of this crop switching, if you will, in the state rules around dual use projects. Um, and I don't know if we want to depart from that. Uh, and then second, um, this idea of of, uh, of a um, set aside of other farmland um, was something that Jonathan sort of encouraged us not to uh, pursue. Um, Jack? Yeah, I guess, I, again, I'm confused. Um, the, the, you know, well, definitely number two there, the substitution of other agricultural uses. Uh, I don't see the downside of substituting grazing with agricultural use, especially when we're talking about soil health, because grazing is actually nourishing the soil, whereas agricultural is actually uh, taking away from the soil, decreasing carbon sequ uh, sequ uh, sequestration. <laughs> um, so where did this come from? I, again, I'm confused why we're speaking. Yeah, I think it did this. come from, um, well, Mark that can also speak to it, but I think it comes from our earlier notion uh, as it was originally drafted that we would require uh, dual use um, in in uh, uh, farm prime far, prime soils and that have been actively farmed, so we don't you lose that farming. Um, and this sense of substitution, and the state has addressed this to some extent. There has been a concern about um, more high, highly valued um, farming uh, in terms of economic value as well as food value. Uh, being substituted due to due to moving to do, dual use, um, moving to um, farms, farming and and uh, and crops or farm uses that are less economically and and uh, valuable in terms of of food production, uh, because because it's just easier uh, to do under a dual use array, um, and I think the the what people generally talk about is the proverbial moving to sort of sheep farming, um, uh, sheep grazing. Uh, uh, so there was some concern about losing prime farmland that's inactive uh, crops uh, for, for um, uh, sheep grazing, for example. The state does address this to some extent in their guidelines for agrivoltaics, um, uh, but um, but to your point, Jack, it's not, it, it's still farming, it's still um, value added, and it, it, and it doesn't necessarily relate directly to the soils themselves. I can, um, if I may, Dwayne, grazing can um, lead to some compaction if you're not rotating, and also animal defecation, depending on the species that you're grazing, can have an impact. For instance, cow patties are patties. <laughs> um, they have more impact on the soil than if you have another species like, you know, goats or sheep that have pellets. So that is, um, I did a little research in this in graduate school, so I know a little bit about that. Yeah, yes. And that might be why grazing is, you know, potentially one of those things that you have to look at. I, mean, I think to some extent this this section may be moot. I mean, we're going to in, encourage if people are are favorable to it of of encouraging dual use on prime farmlands that are currently being farmed, not requiring but encouraging it. I don't know if we need to go further and say, oh, we're encouraging this, but you can't do this, this, or this. Um, uh, but leave that up to the state. The state already has rules with regard to what the um, uh, a, a, a land or a solar project, a dual, a dual use project can look like with regard to fuel, um, not fuel switching, but crop switching. Yeah. And maybe just leave it up to, this, to the state's guidance and rules of, around that to qualify for agrivoltaics. All right, uh, Laura. 
No, I was just going to support that. I was going to say that um, I, I'm pretty sure the state has very clear clear regulations on what qualifies. And then also, if there was if there were livestock um, next to a solar farm, the only type of animal you would use are, are sheep. You would never put cows or goats next to a solar project. They would just destroy it. So um, to date, the only animal I've ever seen that's been permitted by any sort of financing party it, are sheeps. All right. Well, the, the um, yeah. Well, there's there's a project in Grafton that's grazing cows or cattle, I should say. Uh, um, that got qualified or got financed. We should, uh, we should we should we should track that one, Dwayne. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Now these are these are uh, you know up high, so the the the, the cows or cows or cattle are not leaning up against them. Um, I certainly understand about goats. Um, <laughs> oh, I think yeah. the point was that of the soil health. Oh, I see. So not just about the impact to the panels, but the soil health. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, my my suggestion would be to strike the second one and leave that up to the to the state rules. Yeah. Uh, uh, but go ahead, Martha. Yeah, I mean, first of all, of course, all four of those statements refer only to to dual use, and they came mainly from uh, Jerry's presentation and the state use, plus uh, Jake uh, Marley. The couple other things I'd say is farmers know their land. If you have 100 acres, you know what part of that is really good for crop growing and what isn't. And you're probably going to arrange to put the solar in the re in the region where the the corn wasn't growing so well anyway, uh, and and so on. But the other thing is that there are a fair number of cases in Amherst where there's a landowner and then farmers rent a certain fraction of that land, say five to ten acres or something, to do their farming and make their living. And so a little of this is was I saw as protection for the renters in the sense that if an owner who is not part of the of the farming decides, oh, wow, I, I want to put up solar, uh, do the renters have any protection uh, to, to still have an ability for farmland? So I saw this as something reasonable uh, for the specific case of the agrivoltaics. And the fact that agrivoltaics is still somewhat in an experimental stage, you know, we really don't have all that great data of what works well and what doesn't, you know. Um, and so I, I thought that really some caution was was needed here. Uh, and so so I felt that the, the, a, a requirement like number two was important in at least some form. You know, we'd had a previous discussion with our nexus statements, you know, a month or two ago about the importance of locally grown food and so on and not wanting to uh, reduce that since our Pioneer Valley is really the most productive farmland in the state. So, okay. All right, good. Um, all right, I guess I'm, I guess I'm struggling a little bit about um, and I don't disagree with anything you just said, Martha, but whether um, this is a, um, based on what the guidance from Jonathan of whether we're sort of requiring things or encouraging things uh, in this regard. And I guess I'm um, inclined to sort of think that, um, if we do encourage someone to do dual use, which is great, um, then do we want to add additional restrictions um, to make it even harder for them to <laughs> think about dual use uh, and, and not go with the straight straight up uh, ground mounted array, um, uh, and and or whether these are are um, restrictions or guidances that are reasonably well. Um, managed by the state program, uh, at least as it stands today. So let's maybe, Chris, you can think about that in terms of how that might be drafted, and then we can sort of think about it um, 
in in, in a in a subsequent um, document. Um, and then I, I, uh, go ahead. Sorry, Jack. Oh, I, I just want to say, uh, referring to the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, that they have uh, guidelines to for the preservation of farmland because they recognize, you know, this area, you know, it does have uh, valuable soils. And Amherst is doing currently uh, most of these things. We, you know, use of Chapter 61A is very active uh, within the town. And that has, you know, its restrictions with regard to solar development. We have an ag commission, or we did used to have one. I'm not sure if we have one right now. Uh, we have a right to farm bylaw. We we have the APRs, agricultural pre preservation restrictions uh, within town actively used. I mean, we do have some community gardens. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I just don't want to have this overreaching with regard when it comes to solar, because Amherst is really doing, you know, a lot. Now, one thing I have a question for Chris is, was zoning protections, open space residential design provisions for protection of open space during transition from farmland to residential, and that that doesn't concern us, but uh, that's in the spirit of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, trying to maintain as much open land as as possible when it comes to uh, when you're looking at you know prime farmlands, et cetera. You want me to respond yeah, to go that? Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Chris. Yep. So yes, we do have cluster zoning when it comes to um, creating subdivisions. Um, cluster zoning requires that, um, well, not in all cases of subdivisions, but if you're choosing the cluster zoning, uh, mechanism, then you um, have the opportunity to make your infrastructure smaller, your roadway, your sewer line, your water line, whatever, can be shorter and smaller. And the properties themselves are smaller. So they're clustered near each other. And then <clears throat> larger areas of the property can be preserved for either conservation or farming. Um, so we do have that mechanism. We also have a farmland conservation overlay zone I think it's an overlay, yeah, uh, that has other mechanisms for protecting farmland. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, let me just go through these la last two and then Laura, maybe um, your comments have to do with uh, all of these things. Um, and I guess the last two, number three and four that Martha has outlined, um, again, apply only for the situation where the applicant moves forward with a dual use array. Um, I guess I would I would um, I, I wouldn't want to put too much specificity on this in terms of exactly what the detailed design should include, only because the this and number four are definitely things that are required submissions to the state uh, for their program. Um, and I wouldn't want to specify things that are not quite exactly what they have for the state, but I would more so uh, suggest that, that um, we have language that says the uh, design and monitoring of, of, the, um, of the dual use array um, as, as, uh, as, as required by DOER uh, be submitted to the town, PGA, um, for their Review. I don't. I, I don't know if we we have any jurisdiction on that. Uh, uh, I don't. Wouldn't suggest that we would um, not make eligible anything that the state wouldn't make eligible. Um, Martha, is that sort of? Yeah. yeah I, the only the only thing I would would say is there certainly are cases where. Uh, the state, for various reasons of physical distance and short staffing and who knows what, do not oversee a project as well as they say on paper that they will or we wish they will. And, you know, some things slip through. And so it really is important that the uh, local uh, PGA or inspector or whatever uh, does have uh, all the information and you know the ability to you know call on consultants or 
oversee and so on. So I wouldn't really like language that, that completely deferred to the state. Uh, I would like to make it easy for developers in the sense of being consistent with whatever the state does. So they're not having to do any double work, but I, I really think that ultimately uh, it would be our municipality that would have to oversee and make sure things are followed. Okay, and, okay. Um, yeah, again, this is not, a re these, these are not um, design, we're not specifying the design requirements, we're just specifying that the design um, specifications are provided to the town. Uh, the town can then also, along with the state, can make sure that the project is designed to those specifications. Um, okay. Um, all right, with that, let me, um, I think we, we went through a lot. I think we have a good framework here for Chris to build on. Uh, appreciate everybody's input. Martha, appreciate you helping to put this together. Um, my intent would be, and I'm happy to hear from folks uh, during the course of the next week or so is to put something similar together um, for Forrest as a starting point um, that we can discuss on next time. Um, uh, if that seems okay with everybody. Um, but otherwise, I'd like to um, move to some uh, any input from the public uh, attendees that we have. If they if anybody would like to um, make make comments or offer some thoughts. Twain, are you asking me to stop sharing the screen now? Or Yeah, I guess that would be as long as everybody's comfortable with where we're at. The, the nexus statements, I think, um, uh, please read through what has been put together. Uh, I think some of this language we've seen before, uh, and we want to obviously combine with the, um, the the breadth of nexus statements that we've discussed a number of, a number of meetings back. If okay. anyone from, from the public is interested in making a comment or asking a question, can you please electronically raise your hand? All right. Um, yep, the, the offer remains open, but meanwhile, um, let's just um, just raise your hand if you want to make a comment. But otherwise, let me just um, confirm we're going to be meeting next on the 18th, um, back at our regular time of starting 11.30 to 1.30. Um, uh, Laura? I just want to tell you, Dwayne, that I'm uh, I'm actually going to be unable to make that day. I'm going to be on vacation with my family. Nice. Okay. Okay. I will be as well. Okay. <laughs> Not with Laura. And and, and oh. Jack. <laughs> Which date are we talking about? Uh, the eight. Uh, let me just confirm. Eighteenth. Yeah, I'll be gone as well. Oh. All right. Are we running into a quorum issue? Uh, um. Stephanie? Anyone else? Not going to be available i don't know about martha or yeah, yeah. dan uh, i'll be available but i'm wondering should we explore um whether people would prefer next week instead of the following week does that make any difference to laura or jack or anything yeah. or i'll be here next friday um who who else uh, was uh, Stephanie? Are you around next Friday? I'm here. I have a conflicting meeting that yeah, okay. starts at ten, but I could maybe see if I can move that to nine. If there's any flexibility, I could try to move that one. Mm -hmm. uh, Martha, did you have? Oh no, uh, sorry, that's that was okay, all. Laura. Um, I am on vacation for two weeks, starting on Saturday, and I'm really trying to maintain that. Um, <laughs> I haven't had a vacation yet, but if if needed, if you guys don't have a quorum, I can I can dial in on the eleventh, but not the eighteenth so much. Yeah. Um, what it may hey, Bob, you're muted. Bob, you're muted. Uh, 
Uh, hold on, see if I can unmute him. I can't unmute him. Okay. Let me try. Oh. I think he's talking to us. Oh, he is. <laughs> but now he's, oh, he's getting oh, back on. There he goes. All right. I don't know if I got through. I just said, uh, yeah, you're through now, but we missed the, the, uh, oh, is this uh, in addition to or a replacement for the 18? I think this would be, uh, in a substitute and then, well, maybe then we'd go to the 25th, but okay. I don't know. Thank uh, you. So let's just think that if we stuck with the 18th, we're, we're missing, uh, Laura, um, and Jack, I think it was. Yes. And and Stephanie, uh, and we don't know about Martha uh, or Dan, right? I'm 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 here both times. Janet. No, I mean, sorry, uh, we don't know about. Um, I think Janet will be back. We don't know about Janet or or uh, Dan, right? Yeah, she should be back by then. She's in Costa Rica, um, exploring the forests, right? <laughs> Natural world. Um, all right, I guess I'd be- uh, You, Dwayne, whatever you- Yeah, I'd be, I guess I'd be inclined to stick with, with our plan of the 18th. 18th, okay. Uh, give us a little bit more, Steph, uh, I mean, uh, Chris, a little bit more time to draft what we have so far. Um, myself, a bit of time to put something together for the forest starting framework. Um, and, um, try to get that out maybe um comments in from anybody who um to stephanie uh and chris uh not to everybody uh but comments on anything that uh you're able to comment if you're if you're going to miss the meeting and i guess cross our fingers that um janet and or dan are back for a quorum I'm not sure if it would take both of them could could i ask you know we're going to be pretty soon starting just taking the whole bylaw from start to finish and going through it. And um, several members have already submitted comments to Chris and, and if there'll probably be others. So how is that going to work? Chris, Can will you be taking people's written comments and uh, to the best of your judgment, sort of inserting them with with a flag that they were people's comments or how how do you want to work it because it would seem that we need to uh get those into a draft um to be reviewed rather than just uh sort of starting from where you are now and then having to discuss every single one of them so i can um put comments in people's comments and note who submitted the comments um Previously, what I've done is I've taken the comments and then things that I thought were useful, I put into the document and things that I didn't think were useful, I left out of the document. So, um, but I can certainly put it in, you know, showing who, who gave me the comments, if people would find that helpful. Well, I don't know if that was even be necessary. I would say, you know, if you could put in all the comments that you think, think are useful, but maybe just flag somehow that these were, you know, comments from, from members just in a general way, but maybe having you polish it as best you think possible uh, with the com all the comments that you think are useful and then flag what really needs to be discussed most. You know, we somehow got to do it in the most efficient way from here for the next few weeks, that was all. So that's just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll think about that. Yeah. yeah. You know, however you think is going to be the most efficient way for us to kind of get through it. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I would, I would um, suggest maybe a schedule for the next, for the duration here is on the next meeting, the 18th, we, we, um, uh, try to reach a reasonable framework on on how we're going to approach force. Uh, and then on the first, uh, we review the drafting that Chris has put together on both farming and force. Uh, and then we use October, uh, sorry, September uh, to start looking at the whole thing comprehensively together. Is uh, force going to take up our whole meeting? Is there that much to say? 
for force, uh, I kind of think that's going to be a little bit um, more. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, it, it, the starting point may be relatively straightforward, um, but um, to yeah. some extent, I think there's nuances there that are. Uh, yeah, more, yeah, there uh, certainly is is some some controversy. I, I I think, but I'm not sure it's a it's a it's a big long document it's more the principle well let's let's plan to go through force and then if time permitting we can look at what chris okay. has put together for the farms uh for the farm language ah uh, yeah maybe that would be good to have a specific session a section then that we start with um uh, yeah we could probably knock off the farmlands yeah and then and then um yeah. on, the, on the starting on <clears throat> the first in september we can look at what she's done uh chris has done for Forest, but then start looking at the uh, entirety of the bylaw. My mm -hmm. sense is that we really want to, um, I, mean, I guess, so, sort of in parallel, we can sort of pull together the nexus statements and introductory stuff mm -hmm. to some extent. Um, uh, well, I think we're in pretty good shape to pull that together. So um, uh, um, maybe I can um, pull together in combination of what we've already created and Martha put together for farms, uh, create a draft for the nexus statements um, as a as a straw proposal. Um, and and while Chris is sort of focused on the on the uh, pro more proper bylaw language. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, I see that maybe what we're calling quote nexus statements, but sometimes just an introductory paragraph might go section by section rather than all piled at the beginning. I don't know. That's a matter of style more than anything, I think. <laughs> You're wincing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'd leave that up to Chris, I guess, in terms of what is generally preferred. Um, mm -hmm. in that. I think um, it's better to have it all in one place. Yep, that's my... I think opinion. legally it doesn't yeah. really matter right. um, as long yeah. as it's all there. Yeah. And then at some point... I think we need to then to, to take a look at, okay, what, if anything, is missing? Or we also need to have a look at, okay, we know there are some known risks. We've seen this recent rash of fires, battery fires, and in orange, the some solar panels themselves caught fire, and and just kind of review the risks and make sure that we have the best possible language in the bylaw that oversees constructions or you know whatever to uh, forestall risks if possible, but at least review those. Uh, All right. I mean, I wouldn't mind trying to do that while we're going through the language, so we don't yeah. have to circle yeah. back again. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, go ahead, uh, Jack. Yeah, I, I, Martha's mentioned this a couple of times, and I feel like I'm missing something uh, with regard to a rash of of incidents. Yeah, I keep it's... getting reports from people about the ones. There's there's one type of battery, and I can't think of the name of it. Starts with a P. That apparently has been responsible for quite a few recent uh, spontaneous fires. Uh, including one near Lyme, New York, where there were enough toxic fumes that came from the plastic coverings of the batteries that people within a mile radius had to shelter in place for 24 hours or something. Huh. Yeah, because yeah. I've been keeping an you know, ear to the ground because we obviously focused on that in intently with the water yeah. supply. Yes, the water uh, supply. protection group. And yes. we, there yeah. really wasn't much going on in that. So that's yeah. kind of news. To me, yeah, and I, I still keep forward I, I, our, to our members. Then the, those incidents. Uh, okay, let Jack finish. Then okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, Jack. No, I'm, but I'm just saying that this is news to me that there that, that this is a, a heightened kind of you know. I think we're getting safer. It, my yeah. mind tells me. Yeah, it, yeah. It, I thought so too. So, until um, I saw the pictures of the solar panels burning in orange. I don't know. <laughs> all right. Well. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Laura. Like, yeah, I'd like to comment on that. I think I think we all should be agreed on the fact that given the thousands of solar installations that are in place, the the tendency to have any 
fire on a solar facility is de minimis. Um, now, battery storage, I, I understand the concern um, to a certain degree, but um, yeah, I mean, we can talk about, you know, we can talk about that as, as you know, the, I, I, I've heard, I did hear about the New York um, uh, example, but the lithium ion batteries are, of course, what is prevalent right now. So I just, I, I want to, I want to just um, be cautious that we write our bylaws, not from a place of fear, because the number of instances there is, is still small. Um, and I think we can include all the protective language we want, um, but, you know, keeping things in perspective, that's all. I'm not saying you're not doing that, Martha, just want to flag that. Yeah. All right, good. Okay, so I think we have a plan forward. Um, I guess, Stephanie, do you want to reach out to uh, ja Janet and Dan to see if they are going to be able to make the 18th? Um, sure. Um, I think Janet is, um, at one point I had pulled everybody about their availability oh, for yeah. the summer. So I just have to go back and take a quick look okay. at that. Okay, well, maybe you already know that then. So, okay. Um, all right. Okay, so we'll plan on the 18th and uh, we'll miss a few of you. Okay. Anything else? Except have a good weekend and um, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for good work today.